You got it locked on Rodeo Radio. Due to circumstances beyond anyone's control, Dr. Dre is in a motherfucking house. So right about now, and I say, Yo, Steve, are you with me? I C E, are you with me? Here's a little something about a nigga like me that never should have let me buy tape from Steve. Ice Cube would like to play a dope shit mix by Dr. Dre. Since I was a youth, I like concert. Now I like the motherfucking rodeo. Buying a tape or two, that's what the hell I do. You don't like Tony A, well fuck you, this is a game. And I'm in it. Ice Cube will fuck you up in a minute with a right, left, right, making you sick. And then you see Tony A is on the mix. Welcome back, everyone, to Rodian Radio, episode 268. That's right, my friends, 268. And before I introduce my very, very special, legendary West Coast guest, got a few minor announcements. Once again, for those of you, uh, I want to thank you guys for submitting your music. Uh, I told you guys, asked you guys to please submit your music to Rodian Radio at gmail.com. Uh, that should be up on the screen, Rodian Radio at gmail.com. You guys, uh, I asked for you guys to submit music. If you can, two or three songs. If you guys have visuals, that's cool. If you guys have a bio, that's that's extra cool. You know, it gives me something to talk about. Make gives me an opportunity to look into your your history. Even if you just have one song, submit it. Okay, uh, and I looked at some emails. I booked uh, uh, already several artists. Uh, so I'm encouraging you once again tomorrow, being Monday, I will be looking at some more emails. So let's continue to uh, uh, you know let's get that pushing. So if you guys didn't watch Wednesday's episode with Cold 187 and Cocaine. You guys need to really, really go back and look at it. We were talking G-Funk history. G-Funk history with, once again, Cocaine, Cold 187, and they got a project coming out. So be, make sure you guys are looking out for that, and I'll be promoting it here on Rodian Radio as well. Other than that, my next guest is uh, needs absolutely no introduction. He brought you guys hits like Give Me Some Juice, Dr. Dre in Surgery, Turn off the lights, the fly, the cabbage patch. We can keep going on and on and on. So without further ado, uh, once again, the godfather of West Coast hip hop, Lonzo of the World Class Wrecking Crew. What's up, Tony? Hey. Brother, I'm so, so jazzed that you're here because uh, you were there from the very beginning and I like talking about rap, West, especially <laughs> West Coast hip hop. So... But before we get into it, I want to share with the public, the last time you were here was November 20th, 2019. God damn, Tony. Yes. And that was episode 11. We are on episode 268. That was 257 <laughs> episodes ago. <laughs> so I'm yeah, glad you're back. That. Yes, sir. You know, um, first and foremost, I want to ask you, you know, first of all, how's everything been with you? How did you spend 4th of July? Man, uh, everything been real cool with me, Doc. Uh, I founded a new a new nonprofit called the Compton Entertainment Chamber of Commerce, and I did a car show on June the second. I mean, July second. Okay. And then uh, the, we did a car show June the, June the second, and at Crystal Park Casino. And June the third, I was uh, doing some celebrity stuff, hanging out, signing autographs and stuff. And the fourth, I didn't do shit. Just chill. I was chilling at the house. Yeah, yeah. Rested up. We don't even have to buy fireworks anymore. All we got to do is look outside. Look, out, look outside, man. Oh, man. I, it's amazing how much money people burn up on 4th of July, but it's all good. It ain't yeah. my money. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, like I, I usually say, people out here buy like two, $300 boxes, but eat top ramen. <laughs> it's the truth. Wow. The <laughs> my partner, a friend of mine, she had a, she had a straight, legitimate... Uh, Regular Red Devil Fireworks booth, right? Okay. And they had about five boxes that were eight hundred bucks. Damn. And she sold out of all of them, and then people started buying the two fifty boxes to make up what they got, uh, what they could have got in the eight hundred box. So people like spending, like burning their money, man. They like burning their money. Oh well. Well, you know what, uh, Lonzo, I have a question. I want to jump right into it, and I want to go back 
to the Super Bowl. And the reason why I'm going to ask you is because you were pretty much, in a sense, there at the halftime show when yeah. Dre performed. And he had the whole, if, a little model kit of Compton, if you right. will. Okay. And there was something there that was quite special to you there. And I saw what it was. Uh, if you don't mind, can you share with people what was there that you, that I believe Dre acknowledged you by putting that there? Oh, man, it was dope, dude, because uh, I'm at the Super Bowl. Okay. I'm at the Super Bowl. I got separated from my folks, and I was in a little private room. And uh, I couldn't get back to my people, so I'm like, I'm going to watch it right here on this big screen, right? I'm glad I did. Uh, I'm sitting up there, and I just got through eating some potato chips. I had some shit on my hands. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I look, and I said, what the fuck? That motherfucker, oh my God, man, tears just started running down my face, man. I went to wipe my eyes. I got shit on my, got shit in my eyes from potato chips and shit. I'm sitting there blinking and shit, trying to clear my eyes up. Man, people say, man, you all right? Man, I'm good, I'm good. Dude, I'm sorry, man. Yeah. I ain't no, I'm a real motherfucker, man. Right. And some shit just touched you, brother. Absolutely. That shit touched the shit out of me. I'm sitting there going, God damn, that nigga did that, man. And for those who don't know, I'm the owner of the Eve After Dark. Yes. I started that club in 1979. Uh, a week after my 22nd birthday. And uh, it, it's been a staple for West Coast hip hop. Yes. And when he did that, it, again, my life changed because just so happened, I had booked a uh, gig with the mayor of Compton mm. to do a, uh, a Valentine's Day brunch. Valentine's Day was the next day. Right. So I'm at the, I'm at the Dollar High Center in Compton uh, me and one of my girls from my nonprofit, we provided the entertainment for the mayor, and it was a it was like an oldie set. I only, play, I, only I might have played twenty records all day long, but right. they wanted a DJ, and uh, because it was based in Compton, a lot of people there knew me from right. the eve after dark, and it was the whole event turned into about me and the Super Bowl show, and man, it just it just was a hell of a thing. Meanwhile, I'm trying to answer phone calls from Channel Eleven, Channel Four, Channel Five. They want interviews now. So it's just been one thing after another. In fact, as soon as, as, soon as that happened, one of my filmmaking buddies, um, we decided to do a, uh, a documentary on Eve at the Dark. And we got about uh, we got about 45 minutes of it edited. It's dope as fuck, man. It's dope as fuck. I'll send you a link. Dope, I'll dope. send you a link. Do, do you plan on like possibly selling it like to a Netflix or Hulu Showtime? You know, or do you want to release it independently? You know what, man? I, um, I, my boy who's shooting the documentary... At, he knows me. He knows the various stories that I hold. Yeah. Okay. Most people don't know how deep I am in West Coast hip hop. They don't know that I was at Peck Park in 1976 DJing on every almost every Saturday and Sunday or, or Sunday playing in the park, just having a, building my DJ business. They don't know that I was only 22 years old on a nightclub and I was the DJ and the nightclub owner. So I was the first cat on the west coast for damn sure to be the proprietor a uh, first dj to be the proprietor of his own nightclub okay i got a resident residency in the club that i fucking own i'm i mean i don't own the building but i own the business i'm, I'm responsible for everybody getting paid security guards cashiers all that shit they don't know that i bought my house from another uh legendary cat guy named by the name of Johnny Otis. You got to be you gotta ask your grandmama about Johnny Otis. He was back in the fifties and sixties. But because my friend was Etta James, she's a friend of my dad, she lived around the corner from me. Wow. So she turned me on to the house and my house was like house party. You, you look at house party right now. You see all these guys, Kid and Play, Tisha Campbell, Robin Harris. Well that's what my house was like in real life. You saw a young Cube, a young Jinx, a young Dr. Dre, young Coolio, young Pooh, all these people, Rose, uh, Body and Soul, D. Barnes, everybody's at my house just chilling. Cause I wasn't married then, and we was running holes in out the house. <laughs> <laughs> Right, 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 we were, right. We were running women out the house like it was nobody's business. I got a studio and I got a nightclub. So everybody would leave the nightclub, come by the house, or we, you know, get up next morning and come back to the studio, whatever the case may be. So my house is a story within itself. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I and everything you saw straight out of Compton, Dre, I mean when the cube when Easy threw Cube and Yellow out of the studio, that was my house. I still live there today. So all those stories, all that activity, Battle Cat, that's where he got that's where he got it started at my house. Cube got it started at my house. So there's multiple stories when you start talking to Lonzo about his history and the history of West Coast hip hop. 
Uh, my club, Eve After Dark, that's a story. Then you go around the corner to do those. That's another story. That's the only one you saw straight out of Compton. But before we got to do those, we were six years at, at Eve After Dark. We didn't get to do those to 1985. We was, we was at Eve After Dark from 1979 to 85. In fact, we were doing both of them. It's almost simultaneous because we only can get the doodos on Friday night. So we still, we still do the Eve on Saturday. Wow. Okay. Wow. And then people don't know that I was doing Eve after dark. I mean, uh, doodos and skate land at the same time. Wow. I would do skate land because after a while we shut the Eve down. And then uh, I was doing so, going so strong in doodos, skate land, which was also in the movie Straight Out of Compton, yeah. was right next door to Dudo. I mean, literally next door. And yeah. the promoter, Craig Schlesinger, uh, Schweisinger, uh, hired me to open up the uh, do the promotion for Skateland, and I got the posters to prove World Class Wrecking Crew did the grand opening for uh, for uh, Skateland, and we also performed there. And he cut a deal with me to promote Skateland, and I did that until I went on the road uh, with, with Wrecking Crew tour. So these are some of the history facts, and people, oh man, nobody know that but you. Nobody, nobody cared to know but me. Okay, and people, well, how come Cube don't know that? How come Trey don't know that? Well, let me tell you, let's do the numbers. I'm 12 years older than Cube. I opened my club, I'm 22. Cube was fucking 10 in the fifth grade. <laughs> Why the fuck would he know anything about Lonzo? Right. Okay, I met Cube, he was 15. Okay, Dre, I met him, he was 17, but I'm still eight years older than Dre. Right. So when I was doing my field work, like Cool Herc did back in New York, yeah. they, these guys were in the junior, junior high and elementary school. Yeah. So by the time they got to me, I was already doing my thing. I'm a grown ass man. So it just it's just a numbers game and they don't know the history. They came to me, I was already up and running. I was I was pretty much doing the club thing pretty solid and I kinda transitioned to the music thing at the same time. So they don't really they don't they don't know the history. Well it's time that Lonzo that you get your flowers, man. You know, and you know what some something that my son told me you, you know couple of years back he tells me you know what that you're always you know shining light on steve yano but what about your story that's what mm -hmm. he would always say so my thing is this like you know alonzo what about your story and because nobody's going to be ever be able to share your story the way you do nobody can do that. okay nobody but yourself and that's why i'm glad we're here sharing your story and giving you your flowers you Thank know you. i appreciate that now uh, i wanted to ask you this as a dj so you have eve after dark you're running it you're 22 years old now some years later Dre comes in. How old was Dre when he was started DJing at uh, Eve After Dark? Seventeen. Seventeen years old. Yeah. Okay, and and then he honors that at the Super Bowl because I, I remember I watched the Super Bowl with my family. Okay. Now, I'll be honest to you. To me, it was a Dr. Dre concert, and they just happened to be playing a football game. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's the way I saw it. Uh, I have two big ass speakers, and I and I have a seventy five inch Sony TV, and I told everybody shut up. I said because you know what. I don't know Dre today. I don't. Okay. But in the 80s, when I, I met him and Steve introduced me, because I only met your, even yourself through Steve. Okay. Okay. So I always got to honor Steve. And when they would come and rap on my mixtapes, I said, so now I'm seeing a guy on TV that used to come to my house. And even though it was in the 80s, that's still an awesome memory for me. Right. Because not too many Chicanos can say, Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, Easy e came to my house and rapped on my mixtapes. Right. So, you know, I just told everybody, this is a special moment. You might see me cry. I said, but you know what? This is part of my upbringing. So it meant the world. So a I lot of people was touched by that, man. A lot of people was touched by that, dude. Because um, in, in my documentary, it opens up. I'm being interviewed by somebody, and they asked me about Dre. And I, said, I just, you know, I'm not mad at him. I just never understood why I was, I never, he never mentions my name. I've been, I've been in some of his projects, but it's never anything that he mentioned, okay? And for me to play such a big role in his career in the beginning, it's like I got forgotten. And I'm like, dude, why, you know, I, I'm the guy that bought you your first car. I'm the one co-signed for your first car. I'm the one that sold you your first car. You know, all the other stuff, not to mention the personal stuff, it's like I've been forgotten. And I'm like, dude, don't, don't do that to me. I, cause I, I don't deserve that. Right. And when he did that right there, that was a shout out without opening his mouth. Yeah. That was the most powerful shout out I could have got. Yeah. You know, that was the introduction to, uh, a, well, I don't know how many million people that day. And, yeah. But again, I'm from the old school. 
You ain't got to you ain't got to give me nothing. Just open the door. I get it myself. And that's what he did. He opened the door for me. Same thing he did with Straight Outta Compton. By putting me in Straight Outta Compton, my life changed completely. My life has been changed again when I was in the Super Bowl. For those who know about the Eve After Dark, that part changed. And just so you know, right now uh, there's three documentaries I'm involved in, in that are in various states of production. Two are directly about me and my history, and one is about the Eve After Dark. So I'm involved in all. I'm, I got. People that's trying to get me building a bouquet right now, flowers. Wow. It's just taking the COVID, just shut every, it slowed everything down. So yeah. I'm hoping by the end of this year, uh, two of them, if not all three, will be completed and they'll be someplace. And uh, uh, right now, I, the only two of the producers know each other. So I'm hoping that the, the, the uh, texture and the quality of the videos will be so similar that somebody would give us a joint deal and make it worth make it worth our while. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Uh, I think it's time. You know, um, I know when I first posted up the flyer uh, up on episode eleven, and I had put, you know, Godfather West Coast Hip Hop. Nobody had a problem with it except like one or two cats, older cats. I won't say their names. Uh, General Jeff. <laughs> Rest in peace. Rest in peace, General Jeff. You know. Uh, why do you feel that he had a problem with that? I'm going to tell you why. Okay. okay. Uh, in doing my documentary, I found out something that I didn't know. Uh, we brought Battle Cat into the studio. And Battle Cat, when Dre left rec- World Class Wrecking Crew, Battle Cat took his spot. He was my DJ. Mm. He also learned how to use the SP-1200. Dre showed him how to work, work the SP-1200. Mm-hmm. I showed Battle Cat a lot of love in the studio. And while it was, I was in, I was in the, in the other room. They were in the uh, control room. I was just doing something else. Battle came, Battle Cat came out, and he's like, "Lonzo, I'm sorry, man. What's wrong? Don't you? What you mean, dude? I'm truly sorry. I didn't know, man. What do you mean?" He says, "At one time, when Jeff was hating on you, I was hating on you too, because I didn't understand why they called you the Godfather. You're not a rapper. You're not a producer per se, but I, I thought that was some, some shit you made up." And he says, "Man, now that I know." I got to apologize, dude, because it wasn't for you. Well, none of us had this shit. Because I guess the interviewer got so deep with him, and his brain started clicking. You know what I'm saying? There's not much, if anything, in the West Coast hip-hop. I haven't had my hands in it in the very beginning. Right. Okay, at some point in time, I I got distracted, started doing other things. But in the beginning, from 1979 till about 1986, 87, I I was busy. You know, I was busy making... Uh, uh, doing groups, creating a label, distribution, concerts, bringing other cats from the West Coast. I mean, I'm a busy dude like that, and I never, I, I got ADHD, man. I know I do. Right. But because I had a successful club and some money, everything I wanted to do, everything I thought about, I was able to finance. Whether it be build a studio, buy a mobile unit, uh, create a record label, all that shit I was able to do. Right. As things came to my head to do it, and I had the crew to do it with. And a lot of guys who came up later on, I got kind of, I, I, you know, the, the tree outshined the roots. You know, the canopy of the tree is so big, yeah. you don't see the roots. All you see is the canopy. Dre and Cube is the canopy. But there's, right. a, there's some roots to hold that tree up. And once they realized who the roots, where the roots came from, he was really apologetic. Man, Jeff never understood that. Okay. Jeff, only, Jeff didn't, he didn't understand the reason why him and Rod Neal and Joe Cooley was even out in the first place because Lonzo created a, a company called West Coast Record Distributors that was owned by me, Egyptian Lover, Rudy from the Dream Team, and Unknown DJ. When we left Macola, I went to them and said, man, let's form our own distribution company. Me and Adrian Gregory, Tupac's former manager, yeah. drove down to Sam, uh, Palm Springs, met with all the independent record distributors uh, at the NARM convention. They all said they would buy from us. Then we all met with Steve um, Steve uh, Sheldon at Rainbow Records, and he gave us all a, dist- um, uh, uh, a pressing deal, gave us all the $25,000 line of credit with no paperwork. Just, hey, man, y'all good dudes? You, we got this. Then we went to Good Fred, who, Good Fred Oil from the Nat Jerry Curl days, and leased his building to make it our warehouse. But that was something Lonzo created. That, was, that wasn't Rudy's deal. That wasn't Egyptian lover. That was Lonzo's idea because Lonzo was the last one to leave Makola before he went out. 
Yeah. And I understood that we still needed to have something. Somebody needed to distribute these records, and that's what we did. And so we formed West Coast Record Distributors on 54th and Western. We distributed the first Rodney O. and Joe, Coo, Joe Cooley album. We distributed the, J, the J.J. Fad Supersonic album on Dream Team Records, which, was, which the first cut was actually Another Ho. But somebody flipped it over, found Supersonic, and uh, because Rudy and the Arabian had a little misunderstanding, that record was sold to Ruthless to build Ruthless. Yes. Okay? We distributed the first King T album. We distributed the first Compton compilation, which gives you MC8, Compton's Most Wanted, PG-13, Vanilla C, and a bunch of other folks. So these are the things that Lonzo did, because when McCona went out, we was, we was done. But nobody still nobody was still nobody was really checking for us back then. Hip hop had not taken a, a grasp yet where people was getting deals. So we had to come up with some way to keep ourselves alive. And because we were already label owners, all we had to go do was go to the next level, which was distribution. And because Lonzo, last job I ever had in my life in nineteen seventy nine was working for a record distributor in Compton. Record Shack. So I knew how to sell records. I knew I had a record list for all the local guys. And when Cola left, I took his list and got the national list. So these are the things that people don't understand. The work I had to put in that you, you don't get plaques for this shit. You just got to do it. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that, that's why people don't understand, don't know my, if, unless you are there, they don't know that I, I uh, when, when D Barnes from Pump It Up, Got the call. Her mama had to page her at my house. She was at my house when she got the call to go to pump it up. Right. Okay. They don't know that uh, her group, Body and Soul, used to rehearse in my studio every day. You know, they don't know that DJ Poole was a regular at my house on a regular basis before he wrote the first script. Okay. They don't know that because these guys are younger. So right. they just go about what they've seen. That, you know, and, and up until now, podcasting, you don't know, nobody, they're not going to read the book. No. They gonna read the book, so unless you get this out yourself through podcasting, this is how I tell my story. Speaking of, speaking of podcasting, got my own show, NWA Stories with Lonzo, on YouTube, and I also do another one on Thursdays with Dr. Dre from Your MTV Raps called Legendary Connects. That's dope. That's dope. That's dope. And we're gonna continue to promote that so that people can go and subscribe to your YouTube and because you, you go live, if I'm correct, go live every every Tuesday and Thursday. Okay, every Tuesday and Thursday, everybody. Okay, now let me ask you this. Uh, um, since you brought up D, I just I just want to ask because I've heard so many different damn stories, and even on uh, the uh, the defiant ones, Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre's uh, 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 documentary, which by the way I, I enjoyed it. Uh, they talked. They I was actually surprised that they interviewed D Barnes, and then Dre actually talked about it. Do you know that full story? What happened? Yeah. The, supposedly that Dre beat her up, or yeah. was that yeah. true? Yeah. Okay. He put hands on her for real. And, and what was the reason for that? At, uh, when D was doing Pump It Up, um, she interviewed NWA, and she interviewed Ice Cube. Okay. Oh, okay. And when the edit when the editors got it, I think she interviewed uh, NWA first, and they showed it to Cube, and Cube did something to diss them, and they not knowing that it wasn't her control. They took it out on her because they got embarrassed. Cube did, a, did or said something to embarrass them, okay? And when he caught her, he had been drinking, allegedly. Um, they caught her at this event and stopped beating on her because they thought she did it. Well, most people don't understand is that when you're in the video, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, a show like that, right. the directors and the producers got control over the content. Yeah, you don't do they the can, editing. They can look any way they want to. Yeah. And that's why that's what reality, happens with reality shows. A lot of reality shows be weak as fuck to somebody get to cut and shit. Right. And then they make it look better because the actual real life shit story is boring as fuck. <laughs> and not until they cut the shit up and make it make it make it good, make it attractive. Right. And they you know, then you know, if, if you see those promos, you know, so and so said fuck you. Well, he might have said fuck you six months ago to somebody else, but then because they cut it together so, such a way, it it it, it uh, garners excitement from the people. And now people want to watch. And right. they did that to D, and Dre reacted in a real crazy way and uh, put hands on her. Wow. I, I had heard about that even back then, but I just never really got the full story. Everybody just said, oh, she was talking shit. But obviously, it, you know. Man, D weighs like 110 pounds, 115 pounds. Yeah. She's a sweetheart, dude. Yeah. She's a fucking sweetheart. She's, and here's the part I was so disappointed. They all be at, was at my house on a regular basis. I mean, regularly. Right. Dre would be in the studio. D then would be in the house. 
you know, hanging out, cooking, writing lyrics, whatever the case may be. My house was that house. Right, right. It was the fucking Motown house of the 80s. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, um, what you call that? Uh, Hitsville of the 80s. Yeah. Everybody, young, a young Easy E, a broke Easy E, driving a Suzuki Samurai. I don't know where they got that six three from, six uh, six tray from in the movie. And brought he had a Suzuki Samurai forever. <laughs> okay, all of them have Suzuki right, Samurai. Right, okay, right. Now, so so for the people that may not know, D and Dre, it wasn't like they didn't know each other. No, right. They they were all buddies. They were we. Uh, D hung out at Dudos with us on a regular basis. D would crash on my couch. Rose, her partner from Body and Soul, lived at my house. Hmm. She was a roommate. She rented a room for me. Okay? And D would come by on a regular basis and hang out with her. So it was, it was strictly, it was very familiar. That was totally, I thought it was alive when I first heard it because I couldn't believe it. Hmm. I couldn't fucking believe it. Okay. You know what? Uh, I, I, uh, um, I watched a little bit of it the other day again, and I, I know I asked you the first time you were here, but that was episode 11. That was over two years ago, so I kind of want to ask you again. Because uh, um, in the in the Michelle movie, okay, okay, um, she said, well, the story goes that I guess she was working and you walked in and met her at, at her job. Man, that's, a crack. that's the biggest lie I've ever told. See, see, see and, and that's what I don't understand, because if she's basing this on a true story, how can she say that? Again... When you when you when you when you tell your story, okay, they can tell it any way they want to. She worked at the store, okay. okay. That that part was true. I didn't meet her at the store, okay. Okay, Tony, I don't even wear fucking socks. I ain't got on socks right on now, right on right now, man. Right, right, right. I, I, I got socks. I don't really wear them that much, okay. And if I do, I wear no shows. So, for when I saw it, I'm like, this is some bull. And hi, I'm I'm Grandmaster Lonzo. My singer can't come to the club tonight. Could you come? Let me get the fuck out of here. I don't say no <laughs> shit like that. I don't do no shit like that. Bottom line, man, um, in real life, I met her on a Sunday afternoon. Just like today, I just got off a plane, right? Right. I came, I came, went home, changed my shirt, came straight over here, because I told you I was coming. Yes, sir. And I just got off a plane, but that day I had a date, okay? I had my girl was waiting. I had, I'd been gone like four or five days, and I had to get some things handled, okay? Right, right, right. And my boy caught me. Lonzo, I got somebody I want you to meet. Dude, not today. I gotta go, okay? Oh man, please, no, not today, okay? Man, look, I need to see 15 minutes. Dude, you got five. He showed up and she came to the studio. All right, let's do this. And she wouldn't sing. She wouldn't say nothing. Dude, I'm finna go, man. Y'all got to get back with me because this is bullshit. Right. And she stepped around the board and started singing and she was blowing. And I'm like, whoa, that's, she can sing, okay? No doubt about it. And she was singing so strong. She's, she looks like five one, five two. Yeah. Little bitty thing. And I'm like, God damn, she got a big voice for a small woman. And I walked around because I thought she might have had a tape recorder or something in her chest. She was blowing <laughs> some Anita Baker, I think it was, some shit like that. And uh, she finally got comfortable and kept singing, throwing hands up the whole nine yards. Okay, cool. And then she got through singing, and then she stepped around to where my boy was, and then she opened her mouth to talk. Yeah, that trips everybody out. And homeboy just dropped his head. See, yeah, man, that's the problem. That's not a problem, man. That's not a problem. That's voiceover material. That's that's, that's money right there. Okay, yeah. that's fucking money. But at that time, I had another girl singing with me, Mona Lisa. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh and according to the movie, um, I Mona Lisa canceled or something. And I ran to her the same day. Now it was about a year later in real life, about a year later because I was still I was still touring, right? And the crew was still together, and uh, we were we were uh, after about a year we started fading a little bit. So I figured it's about time to do something else. And we, the crew was talking about doing some other shit, and I'm like, okay, before y'all go, we gonna do something else. We gonna do this one more slow record. They was like, no, nah, we want to do some reality raps. Look, man, hold on. Lovers, which is our biggest cut, was blowing up. Yeah, that's, that's what got us most of our gigs. Right. That's what got us our distribution deal. I mean, our record deal with CBS, Epic, was Lovers. Why, why take a chance on some new shit right now? Okay. Let's go back to our regular format, make another hit. Okay. Oh, man, no, 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 no. So anyway, I finally talked him into it. But the girl who, who I wrote Lovers for, I mean, turned off the lights for, Mona Lisa, she was in, in uh, Connecticut working with another producer named Kashif. She couldn't do the song. But I'd already booked the studio time. 
I had the musicians there. And this is the difference between now and then. Right. Okay. I, I, I had money on the line. I got, I got about $2,000 I got to spend today. I can't get it back. Right. When you buy studio time, that's your time whether you use it or not. Right. Okay. So I'm under a little bit of pressure. So I'm going to call this girl who I met a few months ago. And she answered the phone. Changed her whole life. She answered the fucking phone. Wow. That's all she did was answer the phone. And no, I didn't have her catch the bus. I went to her mama, grandmama's house on 39th, and 39th place in Western Normandy and picked her up and brought her to the studio. Wow. Wow. That's awesome, man. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and take a 10-minute break. We're going to come right back after, and I'm going to ask you uh, some DOC questions. You got it. I know you interviewed DOC not too long ago. Well, I'm not sure exactly when. And then I kind of want to get into a little bit of some controversial music questions that I wanted to bring up to your attention. You Since you are the godfather of West Coast hip-hop, I need to ask you. Okay, everybody, once again, call somebody, text somebody, slap the shit out somebody, let them know that the godfather of West Coast hip-hop is in the motherfucking building. We'll be back 10 minutes. What's up, it's Bella. I'm here on Rodeon Radio with my boy Tony A. The Wizard. Stay tuned. Yo, it's Ray Monique on Rodeon Radio with Tony A. The motherfucking wizard. Tune in and subscribe. What's going down, everybody? This is Big Rich G here at Rodeon Radio with Tony A. You guys got to check this out, man. Don't miss out. Tune in. It's your boy Producer A here at Rotom Radio. It's your boy Tony A. Make sure y'all subscribe every Sunday, Wednesday, 7 p.m. with the dopest podcast popping in the motherfucking West Coast. Make sure y'all subscribe. Peace. Yeah, this is Pablito here at Rodium Radio. I'm here with Tony A, the wizard. Tune in. What's cracking? It's your boy Noel G in the house, a.k.a. Hector. You guys know what time it is right here with the Rodium Radio Show, hosted by your boy Tony A, the wizard. Ha <laughs> ha! Keep listening. We got something good for you. What's good, beautiful ladies? It's your boy, MC Magic. Tony A, the wizard. You already know. Rhodium Radio Show. Turn it up. Mm. Yo, what's up? Good with y'all. This your boy, Big Prodigy, from the legendary South Central Cartel. And I'm over here chilling with my homeboy, Tony A, the wizard, on the Rhodium Radio Show. Make sure y'all like share and subscribe to the page on youtube and by the way check out that interview with yours truly you dig wes what's up guys this is my youtube you're watching royal radio with 28 the wizard hey what's up everybody this is little silent from botg the voice of the ghetto man Tune in every Sunday and Wednesday to Rodeo Radio. You already know, hosted by the legend himself, Tony A. The Wizard, man. Just don't miss out, man. That should be active out here. What's up, everyone? This is Antonio Palayo. I'm here at Rodeo Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Make sure to subscribe. Yo, what's up, everybody? L.A. Baseball Head here, also known as L.A.F.C. Soccer Head, chilling on Rodeo Radio with my homeboy, Tony A., the wizard. What it do? DJ Joe Cooley. You chilling with me, DJ Tony A., the wizard, and Rodeo Radio. You heard me? What up, everyone? This is Solita. Tune in to Rodeo Radio, hosted by Tony A., the wizard. What up, what up? Susie Q in the motherfucking building. I'm here chilling with Tony A., the motherfucking wizard. Rodeo Radio, YouTube. You guys check it out. Subscribe. Spank it easy. Yo, this is Shady Boy right here with Tony A., the wizard. I'm Rodeo Radio. What's poppin' with it, family? It's your boy, Jokes Loves Life. And you are now tuned in to Rodeo Radio with the one and only Tony A., the motherfucking wizard. That's right. Love life, y'all. It's your boy, We Throw Trees, Rhodium Radio in the house, Tony A, the wizard, what's up? What's up, it's your boy Panther on Rhodium Radio, tune in with your boy, Tony A, the wizard, and make sure you hit that subscribe button, yeah, yeah. This is Murray Brumfield, a.k.a. Mexicali Slim, Familia Records, and you rolling with Rhodium Radio with Tony A. Yo, what up, it's your boy, DJ Kazam, we're right here live, Rhodium Radio with my boy, Tony A, the wizard, that's what's up, Ooh. 
What's up, you guys? It's your girl Mariah Avila. I'm here on Rhodium Radio with Tony the Wizard. Please subscribe, like, and comment. Yo, it's cracking. It's your homeboy, Mr. Motherfucking Junebug. And you just tuned in to Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Motherfucking Wizard. And don't forget, subscribe to the channel. You know. Juvenile Raza, it's your homeboy Hypnotic, right here in Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. Make sure you subscribe, like, and do all that. Don't forget to comment. Much love. Yo, 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 this is Grinch o Brown on Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. Keeping this shit popping, all West Coast, all love. Shout out to my raza, we getting it. Hey, look, this is Chunks, the San Diego All Star. You are now tuned in to Rodium Radio right here with Tony A. the Wizard. Tap in. What's up? It's your girl Carolyn Rodriguez here at Rodium Radio. Make sure you tune in every Wednesday and Sunday to Tony A. the Wizard. What's up, y'all? This is DJ Tony G. You're listening to Rodium Radio with your homeboy, Tony A. the Wizard. Rhodium Radio. Yo, what's cracking? It's Two Max with Mexican descent, visionary shapeshifters, Good Life Project Blowed, LA Underground Hip Hop. You're tuned in to Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard on Wednesdays and Sundays. LA Hip Hop will save the world. All right, what up? It's your boy King Cash right here at Rhodium Radio with the homie Tony A. the Wizard. Make sure you guys subscribe. Yo, what up? It's your boy Trouble P here at Rhodium Radio with your boy Tony A. the Wizard. Make sure y'all subscribe and tune in. West Coast. Yo, 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 yo. What it do? This your boy, Big Havoc. One hood admiral. South Central Cartel general. And you're tuned in to Rhodium Radio with my boy, Tony A. The wizard. Stay locked in. Hello, everybody. This is Rocky Padilla. And you're listening to Rhodium Radio with Tony A. The wizard. Hey, what's up? What's up, my people? Hey, Trouble Kid right here, you know, in the house. Shout out to Tony A, the Wizard, and shout out Rodium Radio. Much love. Thank you for having me. What up, world? It's YQ, Young Quicks, and right now you're listening to the OG Tony A, the Wizard on Rodium Radio. Make sure to keep it locked, subscribe, comment, hate. It don't matter, man. We get into it. It'll five stand up. Hey, what up? It's your boy, Mark Cruz. You're now tuned in to Rodium Radio with Tony A, the Wizard, the legend. Tap in. What's happening, everybody? It's your boy Queenie. You're tuning into Rhodium Radio. Check my man, Tony A. The Wizard, every Wednesday and Sunday. Stay tuned. Comment, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. You know what it is. What's up, Pimpin? It's your boy, Johnny Boy, a.k.a. Mr. Las Vegas, at Rhodium Radio with your boy, Tony A. The Wizard. Yes, catch us every Wednesday and Sunday. Yeah. Hey y'all, this is Elvia Cadena here at Rodeon Radio with motherfucking Tony A, the wizard. Make sure you guys subscribe, like, and share. Welcome back, everyone, to Rodian Radio, episode 268. And we're going to go ahead and jump right back into it with the one and only, the godfather of West Coast hip-hop, Lonzo, from the World Class Wrecking Crew. And if you haven't gotten his book, it's called Not Without Alonzo, NWA. NWA, baby, Not Without Alonzo. Exactly. So, and we're going to get into uh, what you're doing with clientele and with uh, Yella, okay. if I'm correct, you know, eventually. But I want to talk about and touch on, you shared with me a story about the DOC, how you knew him. If I'm correct, I know when he was... 
with the Fila Fresh crew in Texas. Right. Okay. Can you kind of just share how, how did you meet him? Well, again, this is one of them stories that if you wasn't there, you wouldn't know about it. Dr. Rock of the Fila Fresh crew was one of the first DJs at Eve After Dark. Mm. He grew up in my neighborhood. So when I started the Eve After Dark, I brought him on. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rock had some issues. He had to leave California, moved to Texas. When he moved to Texas, he, st- he started being a DJ for the Tom Jordan Morning Show. Blew up! Blew up! Wow. We went to Texas to perform in Texas. Still got Rolls Royces and shit going on like a son of a bitch, right? Like that? Like that. Like that. He was the man. I'm not bullshitting, okay? And it made me feel good when my boys blew up. Okay? Yeah, he yeah. Was, he was my first doctor to blow up, okay? Wow, wow. wow. And that's, that's what he said. I, I was your first doctor. I'm the first one that blew up. You're damn right. I got to give it to you. And uh, so we wrecking crew. We blowing up. We go to Texas. We hook up with Dr. Rock. Treat us like kings and everybody hooked us up. We, we had a good time in Texas. Well, he had started his own rap group, the Feel Fresh crew. That's where I met DOC at. So hmm. then um, we got to talking. He wanted to get in the studio. Dre do some beats for the Feel Fresh crew. And uh, so Dr. Rock and, and uh, DOC flew out here to L.A. And they did some st- stuff for uh, the Fresh crew. If you look at the first N.W.A. The Posse album, uh, one with them on the, in, on, the, uh, on the Jeep, on the right. Sam- Luki Samurai, and they're behind McCullough. But flip the record over and you see their songs on there from the Feel the Fresh crew. Yes. And DOC credits me with, uh, when it introduced him to Dr. Dre. And, you know, kind of sort of, okay, cool, I'll take that. And, but um, last year, during the pandemic, he was doing this documentary. He called me up, called me a person. Lazo, he's doing my documentary, dog. I got you, man. But I want you to do my podcast too. No problem, big dog. I got you. So I do his documentary, and uh, I'm in the fr- I'm in it. I'm in the first part. You know, I'm always in the very beginning of most people's documentaries because I'm usually there in the beginning of their yes. careers. Um, and he he does my podcast right, and man, me and Doc, me and the DOC. First of all. I know he was a Gemini. That was a, that we we jailed, we jailed on that part. I forgot he had a kid by Erica Badu. He was telling him about his drinking, this drinking problem, what he had to go through, and all this the accident. And he just opened up to me, man, like a like a big brother, man. Just opened up to me, and we just got to talking, and we talked for like an hour and a half, man. And I realized after we got through talking, I didn't fucking push record. <laughs> I did not fucking push record. <laughs> And I was too fucking embarrassed to tell him, man, we got to do it again. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. I've, I've, since then, I, we've talked. He said he'll do it again for me. But that particular time, man, I was like, oh, I, I, dude, dude, I, I didn't know what to do. One, one of my best interviews. I mean, he just opened up, man. He just opened up, talked about the drinking thing and the accident and the death row stuff and hanging with Tupac and Dre and everything, man. He was just really, he really was a... Uh, Probably one of the most open interviews I've ever seen him do, and because he knew me, he felt comfortable with me. Yes, you know what I'm saying? Yes. And uh, I didn't fucking pitch record, man. So wow. one of my biggest blunders in podcast history, man. So I'm human too, Doc. Yeah, man. Wow. You know now, it, since you didn't press record and only you know the stories, do you mind sharing what happened that night of the accident? What, what did he say? He said he was just. He said he would. He was. He was doing a lot of drinking, man. Shit was a lot of shit was going wrong in his life, and he was having a serious drinking issue, man. He just his, his record was about to blow up, and he just yeah. you know drinking just like in the movie, man. He was doing too much, you know. Shit was moving so fast. He country dude, yeah, big old good country dude, okay. And he wasn't used to this shit, man. He got all this alcohol and fame and stuff. Got an album that's about to come out, blow up to blow up, and. uh and he said, man, he just did too much too soon and ran his, ran his car into a uh, hit. I forgot what he hit. But uh, and of all the things for him to uh, to uh, hurt his vocal cords, most people get a broken arm, a broken leg. Yeah. But he messed up his vocal cords. You know, do you know where, what, was it off the freeway? I, dude, or? I forgot, man. I, 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 I could, I could make up some shit, but I, I don't, cause right. these people don't, pe- these people know they're going to check my ass if I tell, say the wrong right, shit. Right, right. So somebody out there knows, okay? I learned right. that the hard way. You don't guess, okay? If you right. don't know, I'll t- I tell you, I don't know. Cause I, cause they will check your ass. Somebody, they, they doing research right now. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. They'll tell you in the chat room shit. Yeah. No, th- the reason why I'm saying is because me, Steve, uh, went to Donovan's. 
I'm not sure. And when I say Donham is audio achievements. Right, okay. I'm not sure if it was the day after or like at least the the same week that it, that it happened, a day or two later. But we went there and we were talking to Donovan and, and uh, um, again, don't quote me on this, but this is what I, I don't know if this is what Donovan told me or this is what was going around in the industry. Okay. I'll say it that way because I don't want to falsely, you know, put this on Donovan. But they were saying that it was late, he was drunk, he was leaving a girl's house, and the next day he was supposed to be on a tour. Right, right. Okay. That was true. And uh, um, some, but the only one that I doubt it was somebody said that he was here on the one ten, but I don't think he was I don't here know on the about that part. Okay, but that was it. And um, the rest, pretty much, we all know that Easy supposedly got the best plastic surgery in Beverly Hills. That's that was what I heard. Uh, got him in the hospital, took care of him. I don't know how true that is. Okay, I don't either. Yeah. So, but that was it. But it 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 was it was sad, and I'll tell you why. At least I have a few good memories of the DOC. I want to say it was March 24th, 1988. And I was sharing this with Yella. When Yella was here, except I didn't tell him this part. Steve took me to go to the Anaheim Celebrity Theater. Okay. To go see NWA uh, okay. perform. Uh, DOC opened up. Okay. okay. I got to see him perform with his voice. Okay. So that's an awesome memory. But he was drunk that night mm. that he walked up on the wrong side mm. of the stage and security grabbed him and literally brought him all the way around the, you know, the other way. Okay. Nobody really knew yet, but they knew that there was a buzz coming out about that guy, mm. you know. And then we went to, we went to the back, and he opens up a forty, mm. and he's drinking, and he he's looking at me, and then he looks over at Steve, and he said, "This man, who's that jab?" <laughs> that's what he said. And luckily, Jare stood up for him and was like, "Hey, man, that's our friend right there. Yeah. That's our friend." Goes, oh, okay, okay. I didn't know. I didn't know. Do you know how Steve got brought into the hip hop thing? I'm sorry, what was that? Do you know how Steve got brought into the hip hop hip hop uh, circle? I, I believe you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I believe you. I was out slinging bootlegs. I was I used to be a underground mix maker. They call them uh mixtapes, but I was making I had a label called uh, Z Rock, a house party, cut up. Uh I had about four or five labels. Did you do there was, there was another one that was real popular called Mixed Tricks? Yes, sir. That, that's you. All those. I did all those. Okay. Yeah. And that was my introduction to the music business. And I was selling them everywhere. Cletus Anderson VIP records, like one of my biggest accounts. But back then, Pico Boulevard was <laughs> the record store, record street. Right. All the wholesalers, the one stop to be on Pico. So I had an account on Pico. I'm dropping off records. I would literally go to Bill Smith Custom Records in, San, in uh, El Segundo, and I had a van. Be full of records. Be full by, by 9 o'clock in the morning. By 3 o'clock, the van is empty, and my pockets is full. <laughs> Can't put no more money in the motherfucking thing. <laughs> And uh, I went to one of my accounts, this guy named George. I walked in, he was talking to Steve. I, I, I brought some records, I had a box of records. And George, he ordered some records for me. And uh, Steve was like, hey, I'm looking for you. I'm like, no, you're not. I thought it was the FBI. <laughs> okay, I, cause I'd never seen an Asian dude in the record business before. Right. I want to talk to you, man. No, you don't. I took <laughs> off running, okay, no, you don't. <laughs> George said, come back loud. He's okay, he's okay, he's cool. And I was real paranoid. because I, 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 I had seen Steve, but I didn't recognize him from the spot meet. Right. I, it was, when he told me who he was, oh, okay, cool. After, he, after I finally calmed down, because I'm like, dude, I ain't going to jail today, okay? <laughs> uh, people don't know that FBI, um, most record, records were technically illegal. It's not a criminal case. It's more of a civil case. But all I know is, is I, on the bottom of the record, it said federal. Fuck that. I'm not going to the pen. Right. The goddamn records. And um, so Steve and Sue, his wife, Steve, he followed me home that day, took him to the studio. He ordered, started ordering records from me, okay? Steve would order 100 of these, 300 of these, 300 of these. Two. I had to get a special order just for Steve every Friday. So him and Sue, I'd go to Bill Smith. I'd, I'd make my cleanest runs on Thursdays. Right. And I'd, make my, I'd, I'd put another order in on Wednesday just to pick up on Friday because Bill Smith was cut, he was uh, cash and carry. So I had to get the money from one guy to pay for the other records. But by the time he got through, I had all the money. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Steve would always come see me on Fridays. Him and Sue would come see me on Fridays. And they would pick up boxes and boxes of records. And then they come to the studio and hang out. And then that's how Dre and Steve and Easy and everybody became familiar with each other. That was this introduction that I, you know, hey man, come on by the house. And come on by the studio. Come on by the swap meet. And that's how all that shit gelled together. It all goes back to Lonzo. It all goes back to Lonzo. Okay, uh, two things. Uh, um, 
the first time I went to your studio, you guys had just dropped the record. Maybe you can remember the year. More bounce to the forty ounce. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was about set, about eighty seven. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was more bounce to the forty ounce. That was a group out of Oceanside. Uh, uh, Trick. Uh, what's his, they, we called him uh, King Trick. Okay, oh, King Trick. And uh, in fact, I'm in the process of doing a USB drive with everything I ever did. Everything. Oh wow. Everything. Everything. Wow. I got I got a couple of uh, record crew albums without Dre them that I did. I never released. Uh, and I got stuff like that. Uh, okay. B Boy Rage. That, they would call they would call B Boy Rage. Were you behind the, the whole CIA stuff with Cube and them? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I remember you you had shared with me a while back. He goes, Cube and them were trying to be Beastie Boys. Look at listen, listen. I I like like you said earlier. I ain't got a lot. Listen to the album. Look at this. <laughs> listen, listen to the Beastie Boys songs, and you'll hear. Uh, they, they sound just like fucking. Uh, uh, what's the name? What's the guy's name for Beastie Boys? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 Damn, Kid at Rock and uh, Mike D. Mike D. Yeah. Yeah. They sound just like the Beastie Boys. Wow. I, I, same cadence, same voice to style, same everything. Now, that's where Dre for Dope Man got, yo, Dre, right. kick in the right. bass. And he was yelling there. Right. Just like the right. Beasties. Right. Okay. Now, um, I believe you were behind this one. I believe. It was Jinx and somebody else. And they did four songs. Remember, it, it was kind of like a comedy version of, instead of uh, funk, uh, um, funky beat. But it was a uh, funky feet, funky feet. Uh, and then my rubber instead of uh, oh, my Adidas. Okay, uh, it was my penis. My penis was it? My, my penis. <laughs> and and, and it's, here, here's some real shit. And straight out of Compton, according to the movie, I got on Dre. For playing Cube's record, for Cube rapping in uh, in the in the uh, in the movie, right? Right. The gangster rap. That's not true. The reason why I got on Dre's ass in real life at Dudos is because Dre played my penis. Okay. Oh. And this is like 84, 85, about eighty five. Okay. And at that time at Dudos Music Center, I had off duty cops working for me. I had three off duty cops and I had a, a security guards. Right. And one of the lieutenants, the white dude, super cool, but I just got through talking to him. We just laughing and joking, blah, blah, blah. And then the motherfucker goes cop on me. Lonzo, let me speak to you right now, please. What's up, man? Uh, you know I can arrest you right now. For what? He says, for playing a record like that, uh, that's contributing to the delinquency of a minor. This is 85. Right. Okay? They wasn't cussing on records yet. They wasn't cussing in front of kids yet. And do those was different from, from Eve After Dark. Doodles was in Compton, and in Compton, you can let minors in to your spot at 14 years old. Wow. Okay, so because Doodles was much bigger than Eve After Dark, Eve, I had an 18 and over thing, but I could I could do 16. It was actually 16 and over, but I made it 18 and over. So I could do seven, 16 and 17 if I wanted to, but I tried to keep it 18 just for the dress code and the attitude, right? But at Doodles, it was like 14. So I got ninth graders in there. And he pulled me over and jammed me up because Dre played My Penis. Right. The, the song that Jinx did, okay? Yeah. And uh, I was jammed Dre up. Yeah. That's why, that, in real life, that's why he got jammed up. Because I got jammed up, okay? And it wasn't about uh, uh, pussy and pistols. It was about my penis and me going to jail, me getting jacked by a motherfucker while I'm paying. That's some bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it was my penis and then the, the Pee Wee Sherman or yeah. something. Some shit like that in Funky Feet. and But it was like four songs in one. So I was just like, man, who is in Steve? Oh, that's Jinx. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. Because I met Jinx when he was about 17. And I asked him, and I go, yeah. And then when, when I interviewed Jinx here, he admitted. He goes, yeah, that was me. Yeah. But fuck, that shit was dope, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going I'm to grab all that shit and put it on one USB yes. drive. You need to. And uh, it's only going to be available through me because I don't want to hear nobody's mouth. Because... <laughs> You know, is it, me and Yella and Cl well, we talk about it, a minute, but we, we we're going out and do a lot of, lot more things together now. Mostly, mostly book signings and shit. You know, we do a couple of little songs from time to time. Like last night, we just up in Sacramento, but uh, I have a I have a lot of stuff in my garage, um, vintage shit that I can't put on. I won't put on vinyl, but I put it on the USB drive. Do you still have Dre's uh, outfit? I sold that son of a bitch. Oh, you did? I sold it. Oh, okay. Damn. 30 racks. That motherfucker came and gave me. I fucking Sotheby sold that. Sotheby's wanted that motherfucker. They said, yeah. They had it on the sale with the, with the Biggie hat. Big, the Biggie crown. Right. The Biggie crown went for $600,000. 
Six hundred racks. And, and how much did Dre's go for? Uh, thirty thousand. Nah, I'm sorry, bro. I would have bought the Dre shit. At least I got the. I didn't try it on. I kind of just put it on when I was at your pad, and I was like standing like the way Dre. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was pre- that was right with the pandemic. I said, you know what? I'm going. I'm in case I get COVID. I'm going to get rid of this motherfucker right quick. Cause I get COVID or something. Check out. I can go out with some money. Anyway, it was all good. I do, do you still have your purple one? I got all my shit. I got all my shit. I'm going to try on the purple one one day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Okay. Look at uh, uh, your. Give us your podcast because we're going to go over some of the some of the the captions that you named your podcast interviews. Okay. Okay, some of them stood out to me, but once again, uh, can you give them your podcast name with sure. Dusty? Uh, it's called NWA Stories with Lonzo, where my co-host is Dusty Vision. Okay, NWA Stories with Lonzo, and you guys go live Tuesday? Every Tuesday at seven, 6 o'clock, we go live. Okay, so make sure you guys subscribe and tune into that. Okay, on one of them, it has a picture of Easy e obviously, the whole NWA group, and it says, I guess it's a question that somebody asked. Has gangster rap caused more damage to blacks than racism? Uh, um, you kind of want to elaborate, like, what did you guys speak? I uh, sure in the fuck will, Doc. And this is one of those times where you got to hold a mirror to yourself. The man in the mirror. Um, we do, we done a lot of damage to ourselves, to our communities with gang banging. Um, I've been in the, I've been in the club business in the same area over forty years. Okay. One of my first clients as a DJ was Regina Chelly High School in Compton, all girls high school right there on Compton Boulevard. Did DJ parties for quite some time, and when I first started doing those parties, security guards were just the fucking nuns with rulers, just the fucking nuns with rulers. And the biggest problem we had back then was slow dancing. Yeah, because nuns did if they wasn't getting none, you ain't getting none. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they hated for me to play slow records back then slow records was um i'm going down by uh a rolls royce and shit like that okay yeah, yeah. and uh and then i used to go to dances a lot at campanella park when i was a kid ninth grade before 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 even before uh, uh before uh regina chaley and be one security guard when i opened the eve up okay 1979 I had one security, I had two security guards. One washed the door, one walked around the club. And the one that walked around the club, most of the time, his job was to bust people trying to sell dope. Mm-hmm. Okay? Uh, the, there's always been gangsters in our community from the 50s and 60s. Been the Smen, the Slawsons, all kind of cats. And most of these guys, they started out to defend the neighborhood from either white boys coming in, kicking niggas' asses, or the police. Black Panthers was was designed to protect the neighborhood against the police. Um, so you always had a small percentage of gangster minded folks, and most of the time, the gangsters dealt with gangsters. They didn't really deal with civilians too much, you know. Uh, by the time I got in the ninth grade, there was a few more gangsters, but again, there was no. If you was a gangster, you even you even you was a gangster. They protected cats like me. I wasn't a gangster. I was just cool. But yeah. I had a car. But by, by, by the time I got to the 10th grade, I had a car. So all the gangsters, well, I'd take them to school. we roll together to school. Yeah. And they run my ass off. Get out of here. <laughs> okay? If a gangster tried to fuck with me, nah, man, that's my homie. You can't fuck with him. Okay? Yeah. You can't do that to him. Nah, nah, he, he, he ain't with this. If I want, I, I tried to be cool and hang out with him. Nah, get the fuck out of here with that, man. You ain't, this ain't for you. Right. Okay? And um, when I got into DJing, that was my thing because, because I wasn't, I was a Centennial and mm. I wasn't a blood, but I lived in a blood neighborhood. I, I would uh, DJ parties for front hoods, uh, Gardena, shotguns, whatever. And I became the DJ man. That's the DJ dude. Okay. And when I opened the Eve up, it was the ratio, oh shit, oh, the ratio from gangbangers to civilians might have been 10% gangbangers and 90% civilians, okay? And you still had shit, you still had skate land, you still had world on wheels, you still had all kind of, you know, uh, Rosecrans are shut down by then. You still had places for us to go. And even my brother, 
he was younger than me. He loved to skate. He would go to Rosecrans skating ring and the shotguns and the and the bloods would get over there. And sometimes, most of the time, they would give each other a pass unless somebody did something stupid. Okay. Well, by the time the '80s rolled around and crack came in, crack made it fashionable for cats to be gangsters. Yes. And at some point in time, they kept they, they came up with this thing on site. Which means anywhere I see you, it's going down. School, yeah. swap me, whatever. So it made the whole hood a hellhole. Okay? A lot of people moved out. A lot of people moved out of the hood because they got tired of, you know, one of their kids may have got killed, somebody close to them got killed, and they just got tired of the whole fucking madness. Right. And it's shit that, you know, it, this is something that we do to ourselves. Yes. Ain't nobody coming in from, from the valley or Orange County shooting up black folks. Okay, this shit we do to ourselves, and this is the part that um, I try to uh, convey this message because even in rap records, with all the motherfuckers out here, the, the proud boys, the the one percenters, and all these cats, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not advocating violence, but ain't nobody shot nobody on record but some old brothers. Okay, ain't nobody, ain't no rapper ever shot nobody but another dude that looked like him. Yes, police do some fucked up shit, but going body for body, we got them beat. Body for body, okay? We got them beat. And this is the part I'm trying to convey from, from an old head, yes, okay? Yes. It's at some point in time, we need to re, somebody needs to rethink the whole position of this gangster lifestyle. We made it so, so attractive to cast that they got no heart want to be gangsters. Wow. Okay, you know you ain't ready for this, okay? And you can't tell me all these guys, because back in the day, in my hood, you had to be able to thump. They called it, that's fighting, yes. okay? I weighed 115 pounds till I was about, I don't know, maybe 20 years old. I wasn't no big dude at all. But I, I, I could handle myself, but not in that arena. You follow what I'm saying? Right, right. I had fights, but I had to f fight against civilian dudes. I ain't, I ain't undefeated, but I got a decent record. But when it came to the gangster shit, no, nah, uh-uh. Because they, they, they fight for pride, okay? I ain't I can't. I, I, can't <laughs> I left Centennial on some bullshit. Hmm. I was an ROTC. I've been a leader. I've been in leadership shit all my life, okay? Maybe wow. that's why I'm the godfather of West Coast hip-hop. I've never been afraid to be the first motherfucker doing some shit. That's awesome, man. Okay? I'm an ROTC, Centennial High School, me and my lieutenant. We walking. I'm the cap. I'm the, I'm the battalion commander, which means I got over 200 people behind me every parade. Okay, I'm the only motherfucker ahead of me is a color guard. Okay, um, we walking through. We walking out of our own business, and some Pyro boys ran up on us, and they asked them, "Where you pop our motherfuckers going?" Wow. Get, we, we we going to the snack bar where y'all just left, right? We just going to the snack bar. It's nutrition time. Okay, and my partner is a six foot four. Redhead, light skinned, freckled dude, looked like Blake Griffin. Used mm. to be on the Clippers, okay? And he stuttered a little bit. And motherfuckers, he says, Why, why, why we gotta be, be some Popeye motherfuckers? And the Pyro boy took over and pop. They squab a little bit. Security guard break it up. Now, between Centennial High School and where he lived and where I lived, there's a park called Enterprise Park. Yes. We walking down a little side street. Going to in, go and cut through Enterprise Park to go to the pad. God damn it, there these motherfuckers are about two days later. Wow. There these motherfuckers are. Now, do we run or try and walk past these motherfuckers like they don't like we invisible? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we we know if we run, they're gonna chase us because if a, if you run from a dog, he'll chase your ass. Yes. We, yes. we going for the invisible route. <laughs> right, right. We're gonna right. try to we're gonna try to walk right past these motherfuckers like it didn't happen, and hopefully everything is cool. This shit didn't work, okay? Oh, now we got you motherfuckers over here, black. Ain't no security guards to save you motherfuckers now. Like, fuck! We finna we it's finna go down. Right. But one of the dudes that I used to take to school in the morning, drive to school in the morning, he was with him. He said, nah, man, this is, this is different than gang banging the day and back then, okay? Nah, man, y'all can't, you, can't jump on them. You got to go head up. Because the dude who I took to school in the morning, his mama, his grandmama, and my mama was partners. They went fishing every day. 
Okay. He knew goddamn well if he let me get jumped on while I'm sitting right there, he got a problem with his grandmama yeah. and my mama. Yes. Okay? Yes, yes. There's a problem. Yes. You let my son get jumped on, what kind of motherfucker are you? He takes you to school every goddamn day. Yes. So now, my partner and one of the gangsters got to go head up. Now, what I didn't know, and the Pyro boy didn't know either, is that my partner had been taking boxing lessons. Oh, wow. When you were six foot four, light skinned, freckle faced motherfucker from Compton, you've been getting picked <laughs> on for a while, okay? Yes, yes. Six foot four, red head, you know, fire red head, light skinned, freckles, six tall as a motherfucker. People are gonna pick on your ass. Yeah. Okay? He, he reminds you of Drago from, uh, from, from Rocky Three, <laughs> okay? And he put hands on him. He put hands on, on the gangster. He didn't beat him up, but he, he beat him up. He, beat, he, he did better than he was supposed to. Yeah. I wish the motherfucker took a dive, okay? Right, right, right. So we can go to school, back to school today, but he didn't, okay? He stood up for his, he stood up for his and he handled his business enough to where the, the gangsters was clowning their partner. You let know, the, you know, the pop our motherfucker put hands on you, whoop your ass. You know, they start fucking with him. <laughs> so the next day, we go back to school. It's fucking, uh, uh, what's that shit? Homeroom. Yeah. One of the girls who lived on Pyru pulled me to the side. I don't know what happened at Enterprise Park yesterday, but they had a meeting last night and they shooting everything and, and you getting with everything in ROTC. Thank you very much for the info. I got to go. Okay. They didn't shoot nobody, but they beat a lot of ass that day. Okay. Wow. And that's when Lonzo realized that this shit is stupid because yeah. it wasn't nothing, man. It was, it was no reason for us to have to get jumped on because the motherfucker fucking with you on some bullshit. On some bullshit, yeah. You got to eat shit or die? No, man. It's not. And this is the part that we're dealing with right now. You got motherfuckers on some internet bullshit, some old hood beef shit. Niggas can't say, I'm sorry. I apologize. Excuse me, bro. I didn't do that. Motherfuckers is where they got them feelings on their shoulders, on their, on, their, on their sleeves. And every time you shake his hand, you offend this motherfucker. Okay? Yeah. And now everybody got a gun. Niggas, yeah. oh, you know how to fight no more. When they do fight, they want to jump one, a hundred motherfuckers on one. You can't lose the fight, but but on the same token, what kind of grat uh, uh, gratitude can you get when you got one or two punches in, but this all you got to do, that motherfucker die, you got a hundred cases. Yeah. A hundred motherfuckers got cases, and the first one tell, the first one go home. So because of this shit, the club, nightclubs. Ain't no nightclubs in, there, in, in the city no more, man. Think no. About it. Ain't no more nightclubs. I know you go downtown in L.A., they got clubs everywhere. But they're all white clubs. Yeah. You go to Long Beach, they got, they got a lot of clubs, a lot of Latino clubs. Yeah. Ain't no black clubs, okay? And I, dude, I, I wouldn't even own a club right now. I wouldn't want a club right now. I'm not bullshitting. Yeah. People ask me after the Super Bowl, you gonna open the E-back up? Fuck no, Okay. I'm not trying to go back there no more because it's not even cool, man. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not trying to get. I'm not trying to catch a case. I'm not trying to get shot. I ain't trying to shoot nobody. Yeah, you know what? I'm. Uh, uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna ask you one more caption uh, from your YouTube page before we go to break, and it goes along with everything you're saying right now. And this caption reads: uh, "Kids nowadays scared to take an ass whooping. They scared to take an ass whooping." <laughs> Let me, tell you, let me tell you another quick story, okay? Yes, Two please stories. do. This real shit, okay? Yes. I was about 14 years old. We played football every summer in the streets, okay? Me and this bully in the neighborhood had been, been going back and forth. I was scared of this motherfucker. I was scared. I think had a big old gravity. He wasn't but a year older than me, but he had a gravity voice. He was real aggressive and always fucked with me and shit. We playing football, and every time we played football with these cats, it turned into a fight. Every fucking time it turned into a fight. So my mom was gone. But my dad was home off of work for whatever reason. Once, as usual, we playing football, fight break out. Now, I didn't got the shit knocked out of my ass. I'm, I'm getting to go home. Right. I'm running home, right? This motherfucker follows me home. Damn. Okay? I hop over the fence like a hurdle. I hurdle my fence like motherfucking <laughs> I'm out on Olympics, right? This motherfucker hurdle the fence too. I open the door. The motherfucker come in the house behind me. Like that? Like that. He come in the house behind me. My daddy, my daddy delivered. What the fuck going on? And, 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 come on outside. Come on outside. But then what, what happened? Yeah, I said, man, he jumped on me. He said, no, you got to go outside and fight him. Oh, shit. I had to go out. My daddy said, no, you can't, you, no, you can't do that. Go, go on outside. And my daddy watched this. Okay. And I learned two things. One, I could take a punch. Two, I could give a motherfucking punch too. 
me and that motherfucker tore, we tore up some shit, okay? Because <laughs> I wasn't scared no more because my dad was right there. I knew he wasn't let, let him kill me, <laughs> okay? But he hit me a couple times and nigga wasn't hit that hard. Let me try some of this Bruce Lee shit I learned on watching right. goddamn movies on Saturday. Let me see if I can something make some of this shit work. I got the kick in this motherfucker. I ain't no karate expert, but that shit was working. It was working. And I, I, it worked for me that day, okay? And that I never, and I never was scared of that motherfucker again. And there's part two to this story. The motherfucker tried to punk me uh, at, at uh, Playa del Rey Beach. Playa del Rey. It was ninth. It was, that was us. I think that was either eighth. It might have been eighth grade. The first situation. It was ninth grade senior ditch day. Everybody got some. Got we got some motherfucking uh, Thunderbird. Okay. We got a couple of bottles of Thunderbird, paid them wine those couple dollars. Everybody, else, you know, we beach, we halfway drunk and shit. Thunderbird give you a headache like a motherfucker, Hell yeah, right? It will. I'm sitting there, I got a headache. This cutie pie let me put her, my head in her lap and had her, you know, kind of blocking the sun on my face. And this motherfucker, just like in an Elvis video, kicks sand in my face. I got a headache. I, before I realized it, I jumped, what the fuck? And we got to fighting. And I beat his ass at, at the beach. <laughs> okay? I beat his ass at the I beat his ass good at the beach. Okay, by this year, I was going to the centennial, the third uh, for the tenth grade. Nobody fuck with me to the eleventh grade. Okay, I had a reputation. Motherfucker, fight, leave me alone. Okay, cool. Okay, right. Now I've been, I've been a little buster. I, dude, I, I've been a little buster all this time. And ninth grade, I wasn't all that tough. I had a couple of fights, but it wasn't like this. And I wouldn't fight nobody with a reputation. Right. So I whooped his ass. That made all my classmates, that motherfucker cool, and his class, no, he cool. And that was my, um, that was my introduction to not running from a motherfucker. Plus, I can't stand bullies. Go on to break, man. Let's go to break. Drink some water right there. <laughs> okay, everybody. Once again, call somebody, text somebody. You guys know the rest. Once again, Lonzo, the Godfather, West Coast Hip Hop. We'll be back 10 minutes. Hey, what it do? It's your boy Cap G. Subscribe to Rodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. DeWizard. Yes, sir.
Yo, what's up, y'all? This is King T chilling on Rodium Radio. Tune in, subscribe every Sunday and Wednesday. Fucking with my man Tony A, the wizard. West up, this Lazy Dub, and you're tuned in to Rodium Radio right here with Tony A, the wizard, on every Sunday and Wednesday, 7 p.m. Make sure you like and subscribe that. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm right here at Local Negro, Tony A, Rodium Radio. Tune in. Yo, yo, what's up? It's your boy MTO right here with Tony A. The Wizard on Rhodium Radio. Make sure you like and subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday. What's up, everybody? It's your homegirl, Lovely, and I'm right here at Rhodium Radio with my boy Tony A. The Wizard. Make sure you subscribe and check him out every Sunday and Wednesday. It's Nina Beretta with Rhodium Radio and Tony A. The Wizard. Tune in Sundays and Wednesdays. Like and subscribe. What's up, everybody? This is a Puppet Master chilling with El Triste. Follow and subscribe to Rodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Rashidi Harper, director, executive producer from Hip Hop Uncovered. And I'm here at the Rodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. Stay tuned. Coming at you live through the harbor area, you got MC Poncho, the number one Sancho, and you're checking out Rodium Radio with my man, Tony A, the Wizard. Check it out. What's up? This is Ronan Gray. You're watching Rodium Radio with Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday and Sunday. What up? This is Mr. D over at Rodium Radio with my homeboy, Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure you subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday. What's up, y'all? This is Uncle Spliff, man, from Spliff DTV. Y'all need to tune in every Sunday and Wednesday to Rodium Radio with my homie, Tony A. The Wizard. Yo, you're tapping in with the Steel City Hustlers. Rodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. The Wizard. A motherfucking legend. Make sure you fucking like it, subscribe, share it through all that. cracking. Yo, it's your boy Troublesome Man, TM Gang Live in full effect. Here at Rodeo Radio with my boy Tony A. The Wizard. You know what it is, boy. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Ernie G in the place to be. I'm chilling here at Rodeo Radio with my homeboy Tony A. The motherfucking wizard. Watch those locals forever. Yo, what's up? It's your boy Young Hype here at Rodeo Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Make sure y'all subscribe and tune in every Sunday and Wednesday. Yeah, doge. Yo, what's up? It's Anthony Campos, a.k.a. Big Citra. Inviting everybody to tune in and subscribe to Tony Vision, Rodeo Radio, with your host, Tony the Wizard. What's happening? It's your boy, Bobby Castro, and I'm here at Rodeo Radio with the homie, Tony A. the Wizard. Make sure to like, subscribe, check out the shit. What's good, y'all? Eric Bobo from the Mighty Cypress Hill, chilling right here on Rodeo Radio with the homeboy, Tony A. the Wizard. That's right. Hey everybody, this is Cliff Ritchie, and I'm here on Rodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. What's cracking? It's the homie Crazy Boy, Blue Rain Music. You tuned in to Rodium Radio with the homie Tony A. The Wizard. Tune in every Wednesday and Sunday, right here. What's up, everybody? This is Dali C, the Trap Queen, and you guys are listening to Rodium Radio with Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure you guys tune in. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Bobby B, and you're live with Tony A, the Wizard on Rodium Radio. 1212, coming to you live from the Harbor area. DJ Rob Fan rocking beats with my man, Tony A, rocking the SB1200. Let's go. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Yella coming straight out of Compton Rhodium Radio with my boy Tony A. The Wizard. Check him out. Hey, what's up? This is your girl, Miss Gathy from NYC. And I'm Saki with Tony A. The Wizard at Rhodium Radio. You already know how to bring the NYC love. Hey, shout out to all of you guys. 
Hey, what's cracking? It's that guilty one. You're tuned in to Rodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Live every Sunday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Like and subscribe. Ah. What's going on? It's Hazard. You are tuned in with Tony A. The Wizard on Rodium Radio. Make sure you tune in every Sunday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Yo, yo, this is your boy Invincible, and you are watching the Rhodium Radio Show with Tony A, the Wizard. Make sure you're tuned in and watching. Ooh, ah. What's up, guys? This is Isabella Soul, and you're tuning in with Tony A, the Wizard on Rhodium Radio. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Peace. What's up, guys? It's your girl, J Rocks. I'm here on Rhodium Radio with your host, Tony A, the Wizard. I'll make sure to tune in on Sundays and Wednesdays, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Yo, what's up? This is Jose Homicide. You hanging out at Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. The Wizard. Like and subscribe. Welcome back, everyone, to Rodeon Radio. And once again, we're going to go ahead and jump right back into it with the Godfather West Coast Hip Hop. Once again, Lonzo from the World Class Wrecking Crew. Uh, if you guys are really tuning in, you're just going to have to, I like to always say rewind because I'm old school. You're going to have to rewind and check it out because you know what? He dropped so many, so many gems, so many dope stories. So you're going to have to go back and check this out. Um, other than that, Lonzo, I needed to bring out a beer. I needed to cool off a little bit. I'm going to take a shot of some tequila. I don't know if you want a shot. Last time you had some whiskey shots with me. But yeah. So. I left here feeling pretty goddamn good. <laughs> I don't Do you, you want to take a shot with me? Yeah, man. Give me a shot. All what right. Cool. Hell? Cool. Let's do that right now. Everybody in the chat room. Yeah. Everybody in the, sh in the, shot, in the chat room, uh, put a shot glass up in that motherfucker. Okay. Here we go, Lonzo. Here we go. Thank you, sir. You know what? Uh, this toast for you and... 286. Uh, yes. Two, I hope... Two, two, the 286? 268. 268. I know, I know something. Let's, let's give Lonzo his flowers, everyone. Much love, folks. Thank you. That shit's smooth, man. Mm -hmm. God damn. It's Palone. In case you want to help yourself some more. Oh, no, I'm good. I, I got to drive, but shit. It's all right. Learn, you got to learn how to drive drunk. That's the thing. Okay. <laughs> okay, Lonzo, I have a couple of more things that I want to ask you about some of the captions from your YouTube page. So once again, everybody, once again, go to go to his YouTube page. And what's your YouTube page called again? NWA Stories with Lonzo. Okay, Stories with Lonzo. Check it out. Uh, put it in the in the, okay, in the description Check as well. Check out Legendary Connect too, folks, for being Dr. Dre from Yo! MTV Raps. East Coast Dr. Dre. Okay, cool. Uh, this one, it says... Secret societies, or should I say, societies in the music industry. What did you mean by that? <sighs> you know, um, I get jammed up all the time about that, so, uh, that uh, le legendary meeting that folks said that happened with all these folks from the private prison industries and the music industry. I is that true? I'm, I don't. I wasn't there. I wasn't. I don't know if it's true or not. But I do. What I do know is that the effects are real. Okay. Whether the, whether it happened or not, right? We know that we have privatized prisons, and hip hop has been weaponized, and people are going to jail at record numbers, and they're going for a long time because they they found a way to make uh, murder, attempted murder, robbery, and everything a common practice. 
So whether whether it's real, whether that meeting happened or not, I don't know. But like I said before, the effects of that meeting is in full effect. Mm. Ha- have you met anybody that's claimed they be- they were at that meeting? No, nobody claimed to be at that meeting, man. You know, if you remember that meeting, they said they had to sign NDAs, and they um, there was people that was threatening people that left. If you talk about this, you know, we're going to deal with you and your family. So it was really a frightening situation, and people may you know for their own security probably never spoke won't speak on it. But like I said, whether it happened or not, it's still in full effect. Okay, well, I guess one last question on that before we go to the next one is, do you know supposedly what was said there? Like, what was the agenda, I guess, what I'm saying? The agenda was that uh, they were going to stop promoting feel-good music, the uh, music that was conscious, and focus on gangster rap to try and manipulate folks to live more of a gangster rap style so they can fill up these prisons and get this federal money because most of your most of your prisons are a lot of your prisons are have contract with the feds they privatize the prisons so now you got the feds spending big money based on their how they used to run it meanwhile cats in prison is getting scraps when you anytime some anytime you privatize something the object of the corporation is to get as much money out of it as possibly can. Their only obligation is to their shareholders. So if the government gives them, I don't know, $10 million to run a prison, they're going to try and run that motherfucker on one if they could. You follow me? Yes. So they can share, share the money with their, profit, with their uh, shareholders. So, you, it, you know, food in prison is shitty. Services are shitty. A lot of the programs that Kathy used to get as far as rehabilitation programs, they cut them out because you got to pay somebody. Yeah. So they're only doing the bare minimum so they can maximize the profits. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. You know, you know I saw this meme, uh, uh, this funny meme. I saw it maybe like three years ago. And I just thought how crazy it was. It had a bunch of white men. They looked like old presidents. All laughing. They were drinking. And they were all laughing. Maybe a, a room full of 20 when they were all laughing. And the caption said, uh, we, we, got, we got them in dresses. All we need them to do is wear purses. You know, uh, yeah, man. It, again, when you see, I hear, I'm going to get in trouble. Y'all might get canceled for this one right here. <laughs> Think about this for a minute, man. On the streets of LA, okay, or the streets of the world right now, if a man comes out, yeah, he is, he's awarded. He's, you know, he's prayed. Oh, you came out, you're brave, blah, 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 blah. So if you can be, have a boyfriend on the streets, and nobody can nobody condemns you. you know, I, I, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. That ain't what, that ain't what I'm saying. Right, right. But if you put in a situation where the only option you got is another man, okay, who would can you, know, you 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 pretty much can't get condemned. I mean, it's pretty much acceptable. If it's acceptable outside the jail, it used to be a time the biggest fear for most cats in my generation of going to jail was getting raped. Of course, okay. If if you go to jail and you've already had sex with a man on the outside, you're already ready to go to jail on the inside. It's no big deal to you. No big deal. Okay? Yeah. You, and you don't care who knows about it because it's acceptable. Okay? And again, I'm not here to debate whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm just saying the mindset has shifted to where it's acceptable to have a boyfriend on the outside. So if you have a boyfriend on the inside, it's no big deal. I had a buddy of mine. True story. I got a bunch of them. Used to be a prison guard. And he's come to you after dark. And one day I saw him. He said, where you been, man? I've been up north. I've been working in the prison for the last longest, blah, 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 blah. I said, I'm finna retire, though, man. I can't take it no more. What happened? He said, man, when I first got there, you know, guys would be in jail 15, 15, 16 years, and they never messed with men. That was just the thing. A lot of guys was, I ain't going that way. I ain't going that way. He said, well, now that I got older, they moved me down to a lower level. And you got guys coming in now just in reception Booed up already. Yeah. Okay. And he says the the protocol and the, at, in order to be PC, although it's illegal to have um, homosexual sex, yeah, you have to address it in such a way that back in the day he said he would say, "Man, get that dick out, get get your dick off that boy, whatever uh, guy, right. whatever." He said, "Now nah, you have to put you, you please refrain from homosexual activity in front of the police department." He said, "I can't do that, man." He said, it's the, "It has to be PC, or I can lose my job." Yeah. See what I'm saying? So I'm, I, if, if I see something I don't like, I have to address it in such a PC manner that it makes it frustrating for me. 
So before I lose my job and my pension, I'll quit. And that's what he did. Wow. Wow. You know, um, I had a buddy of mine a while ago. I mean, he wasn't a close, close buddy, but I knew him for at least 10 years. And uh, he beat up a dude in a nightclub. He didn't know, obviously, the guy was gay. The guy started shit with him. Whipped his ass, knocked him out. Mm-hmm. It became a hate crime uh, because he told the police that he beat me up because he knew I was gay. Right. So he, he got some years for that. Wow. Yeah. And But that's where we're at, yeah. you know. So let's go to the next question. And this one, um, I, I, I know he kind of, I'm gonna, he has some typos, so I'm going to try to give okay. it to you the best. Uh, can you ask Lonzo about how Gangster Chronicles, like I believe that's the podcast, mm-hmm. uh, how MC8, spoke on not getting paid after the fact he got uh, the distribution deal. He believes he only got around two G's. Well, he says not getting paid, but then he believes he got about two G's. So um, he, I heard him say this, that he never got shit. I believe from his first two albums. Right. How, how true was that? Or uh, when I was on the show, he said, he, uh, cause first, first of all, somebody accused me of not paying him. Oh. That's how the whole conversation, how, how, how the whole conver- uh, controversy started. Right. I'm like, dude, I had them on my Compton compilation. I did a deal with an unknown for them to go to Orpheus. Okay. Hmm. They were under unknowns label. Old school uh, label. Techno yeah. hop, right. And uh, the deal with Orpheus was so bad that there wasn't a whole lot of money. I only got like fifteen hundred dollars just for my little contribution. Okay. They ended up using two of the songs that was on the, comp- on the comp- compilation. And change the publishing everything. Makes it another story. Anyway, um, somehow or another, the contract was so bad, it wasn't a whole lot of money. Okay? And by the time they paid for the studio time, back then, this is re- this is regular re- record business. Studio time, production fees, blah, blah, blah. Wasn't, enough, wasn't a whole lot of money left over, according to what I heard from Unknown. Okay? And um, these guys were young. And just like with me, if you ask straight them, they didn't make money with world-class record. That's bullshit. Okay? The problem in some in most cases, people spend money so fast they can't appreciate it. Okay, um, and I'm I'm and A said he didn't get we got three or four thousand dollars off of an album you know that did supposed to do some pretty good numbers. Yeah, and still hadn't got anything. So we didn't go into a whole lot of details, but he said that that was a problem, and that was from uh, uh, I guess it was because what happened was oh yeah, Orpheus went out of the guy Charles Huggins went to the pen. Okay. He was Melba Moore's uh, manager and husband. He screwed over her, screwed over everybody. I mean, he he, it's, he, he just was a bad dude overall. And um, Mel- Melba Moore was that as we lay? Huh? Was that the? As, yeah. Wow. But, but no, was that as we lay? No, 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 no. I'm Melba, trying to remember who was. That, as we I think that's a uh, Melba. That might have been a uh, Melissa Morgan. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, you're right. As we lay, Melba Moore. She was more of a uh, '70s, early '80s artist. Great singer. But she was married to this dude named Charles Huggins. Okay. And Charles Huggins, he, he, he was such a bad dude. He had his own episode of uh, I, I, I Almost Got Away With or something like that. Okay. Yeah, he was on TV with his shit. He was, he was that fucked up, okay? And he took everybody's money. Took the record company's money. Took wow. everybody. Didn't pay nobody. Bought a bunch of big old mansions somewhere back east and was doing great till the fans came and knocked his ass down and put him in the pen. Wow. So that was, they were part of that little situation. Wow. So... That's when the record part, record company, record deals were a lot were layered. You had the parent company. I think I don't, was it. I think, um, I think it might have been on MCA. I'm not sure. Don't hold me to that, folks. They, then they were signed to Orpheus, the label. Then they were signed to Unknowns, um, uh, production company, and they had various producers, Slim yes. and Unknown producing their stuff. So you had a whole lot of hands in the pot. So. Uh, a platinum record might not have got you very much money based on your deal. Plus, they had bad management too. Uh, another cat that was supposed to be their manager didn't take care. Probably uh, did a lot of unscrupulous things. I'm gonna put it like that. So, do, do you think you know for for if you will, up and coming artists that want to get into this industry? Uh, do you think it was a case possibly that eight just didn't know the business? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, most artists are so anxious for the attention and the notoriety, they fucked the contract. He gave me a Rolex or he gave me some money. I got me a new car and I'm balling for right now. I got more money than I ever seen before. So I give you $50,000, you 18, 19 years old. You think that's the, you think that's the, you never be broke again. I know I did. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, it's funny, Lonzo, you said that real, really quick. I had a, a kid that came to me and goes, this record label offered me some money for, uh, you know, 
uh, a record deal. And I said, okay, I, what are they offering you? And he said, uh, 20K. And I said, okay, 20K. He goes, man, that's all real good right about now. And I said, okay, for, but for how long? And he said, oh, for two years. And then I said, look, bro, you can go to, go to Subway, make minimum wage, make more in a year. I said, I'm just letting you know. Right. He goes, yeah, but it's quick money. I said, okay, ask him a couple of questions. Number one, ask him if it's recoupable. And he goes, what's that? So I explained to him what recoupable was. Right. Ask him within those two years, how many albums does he want from you? Or what does he expect from right. you? Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, are you going to see anything on the back end when he sells those, 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 that music? Right. And he was like, okay. So he came back and he said, the guy wants to sign me for two years and he wants at least four to five albums. Okay. And I go, does he, gonna, does he plan to give you the 20K all up front? And he goes, no, every six months he's going to give me five. And I said, well, he's going to sell your records and pay you with the records you sold. Right. And I said, you know, but what I'm saying is that these kids today are just so 20K, j just to hold it up to their ear like they're on the phone and take an Instagram picture. Right, right, right. right. The instant gratification. I uh, saw an interview one time with Blueface. Okay. On, uh, on the, what's that, um, Charlemagne the God okay. the show, right? He asked me, man, who, how's your business? How, how's your contract looking? He, he said straight up, I don't know. My, my manager would take care of that right there. Okay? And I said, oh, there you go. So he made a time mm -hmm. before he could be crying about how he got screwed. Before, and, he, before he missed a, a diss song. Right. The, uh, it don't, at this day and age, with the record business being what it is, mm -hmm. how it's changed, um, there's no reason why you should take a bad deal. I mean, so when you come into a deal, or come into any deal, the first couple of years, it's going to swing in the favor of the, of the label because they got to put a lot of money out. Yes. Okay. And but again, within two years, two or three years, based on your sales, you should be in a much better position, and you should have that spelled out in your contract. Right. Most people don't think about that. They just sign whatever they sign, and they usually five, sign the five to seven years. <clears throat> but what you what, what they don't realize is your first two albums are probably going to be your best. Yeah. Your first two albums are probably going to be your best if you have any success on the road. Your attitude is going to change so much. You ain't the same person you were on the first album. You know what? That's very, very important what you just said right there. You know, if you're going to be on the road, your attitude's going to change. You're not going to be the same, you know, that you were on your first. It's very, very true. You, you won't be as grimy. You won't be as loving because you're going to get, if you're a lover, you're going to be hating because you, you got fucked over. If you're a gangster, you're going to be mad at everybody even more. Or if you got some real money, you might not be as mad no more. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, if if that was your get down, your anger was your get down. You get you some money, get you a nice car, a nice house. You ain't really mad no more. Or you got to start lying to yourself to try and stay real to your people, and then that's a problem. Because motherfuckers see you got a big old house. You can't. You can't. Dre can't talk about being broke. He can't talk about hood shit no more. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. You can't. Yeah, you know what? And I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to say something. I won't mention their name, but I knew a Compton rapper <clears throat> uh, blew up on his first record. Blew up, uh, went double platinum. Ended up moving, made a lot of money on doing shows to Calabasas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Couldn't come with another fucking hit if his it, if it life depended on it. So one day he, we talked and he told me, man, I don't know why I can't come. I, I almost feel like I, I have writer's block. On, and I said, Bro, your last hit was five years ago. You moved out the hood. Look where you're living. Right. Back then you lived, you breathed all, all of that right. shit. Right. It's just not in you anymore. Right. That part's not in you, okay? Yeah. Now, do you want to go on some, on some Jay-Z shit? Nobody want to hear that shit. Yeah. No broke motherfucker want to hear about how much money you got. No. <laughs> I don't want to hear about how I'm, I'm struggling. It's, it sounds good to you, but in real life, nobody wants to hear you having, having good times. People, people can't relate to you. Right, right. I have one more question before we get into the little controversial stuff that I want to talk about. Uh, I, I don't know how you can answer this. I don't even know if you even have the answer, but maybe you can just uh, uh, give us your opinion. Okay, because that's all it is, your opinion. Um, somebody asked, Death Row at one point probably had the most popular independent record label in the world. Okay, uh, um, they had Dr. Dre, they had uh, um, Tupac. Tupac, they had Snoop. Snoop. Uh, the Dog Pound, they had Nate Dog, they had all of these artists. Says if Suge knew that they were pretty much running their airwaves globally, why would he rip them off? I know that's a tough one, and you know because look, people say they left Lonzo, Lonzo ripped us off. People left say when they left Ruthless, Ruthless Records, Ruthless ripped us off. People left 
death row, death row ripped us off. And it just goes on and on and on. So did you ever know Shug personally? I met Shug. We had a couple of conversations, not a whole lot. I never spent a real time with him. Okay. I think the problem with most independent labels back then, they didn't have anybody to really mentor them. Okay. 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 Um, when you're a gangster rapper, you're doing something that's so unique. Nobody really wants to fuck with you. All they want to do is fuck with the money that you make. Yeah. Okay. They don't care if you kill each other. They don't care. They don't yeah. care nothing about none of that shit. You guys making money, and that's, I don't understand how you do it, but go ahead and keep doing it because I need my cut. Um, Suge didn't have anybody that, that could ever really pull his chain. Okay. Mm-hmm. I got to use myself as an example. Even after dark, I made a lot of money back in the day. Yes. I'm 23, 24 years old. I'm making and balling. I'm making I'm balling at, at, at that day, at that day and age standards. Okay. Yeah. 20 from a 20, 25 grand a month. Okay. Damn. No matter how much money I made, my daddy didn't give a fuck. Okay. <laughs> you steal my son, I'll fuck you up. And that's a good thing. Okay. Jeffy, the owner of the club, he was worth millions. Give a fuck about your little bit of rent. If yeah. you don't do like I tell you, you can't have this motherfucker no more. I will snatch this motherfucker from you. I was look. Let me, let me say something. I was just as crazy as any other motherfucker out there, man. Any young mo- dude. I'm 22 years old. I went from minimum wage to making 15, 20 grand a month. Okay. I got introduced to cocaine. I like that shit. That shit was fun. Yeah. Okay. But I also realize that shit drive you broke yeah. and get you killed. Uh, uh, fuck you up, okay? Yeah. So I left it alone, but it was fun when it lasted, okay? And I was carrying guns. I was catching cases. Okay, I was doing all the dumb shit that the average young motherfucker is doing today. But the difference was I always, my, my dad never knew what I was doing drug-wise, okay? Nobody knew but a couple of people, okay? Number two, when I started catching cases, motherfuckers tipped me down. Look, motherfucker. I don't need your bullshit, okay? You go out here going to jail and shit. I got I got booked for attempted murder. I shot up in the air. A cop booked me for attempted murder, okay? Just because you shot up in the fucking air. I shot up in the air. And I was, uh, God was in that direction, but he wasn't, he wasn't in the direction of the gun. Make a long story short, but these two old motherfuckers pulled me to the side. Give a fuck how much money you making. Do you want to keep making this money? If you do, you got to straighten your shit up quick. You got a couple days to get right or else we closing this motherfucker down. And I got one or two things to do. Either get right or get on. Okay? Yes. And that's what happened. And that was the difference in Lonzo coming up and guys today coming up. When Suge is making, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, man, who the fuck is he going to talk to? You got a rapper right now, motherfucker making hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars talking about bitches and hoes. Who going to check his ass? He paying your, he bought you a house, bought you a car. Are you going to tell this dude he's on the path to self-destruction? In most cases, no. No, a bunch okay? of yes men. You, you got a bunch of yes men around you. Don't give a fuck about what you do. This is why R. Kelly's in jail right now. Wow. You got motherfuckers around you. They just want you for what you can do for them. Whether you get access to tickets or whatever the case. Somebody, some of the girls' mama was grooming them to get pregnant by R. Kelly. Why ain't why they asses in jail? Okay, so you got guys like, uh, you got cats. Uh, like Michael Jackson. Yeah. Okay. He ain't got none of his family around him. Everybody around him is yes men. Oh, Mike, don't worry about those kids. Come on. I got some kids. We can break by here. Have a little party for the kids. He might just be one case. They got kids over the house a few days later. Yeah. If that was, if Catherine or Tito was around that motherfucker, Jermaine, Mike, get them kids out of here. You just got a fucking case. Yeah. Get them kids the fuck out of here. Can they give a fuck about you? Yes. And most people, in, and when you get to a certain point, you want a bunch of yes men around you to keep your ego blowed up, but they don't give a fuck about you. They don't give a and, fuck and about you. And as soon as your ass go down the tube, they'll be the first one doing the goddamn documentary, R. Kelly. Everybody he was fucking with that was on his team was part of that documentary to, set, to, sink, his, to, uh, to sink his goddamn boat. To talk his shit about him. To talk his shit about him. But you was eating at his goddamn house. You brought your nieces over there. Some people brought their daughters over there. Yeah. Okay, but now the motherfuckers, fuck, oh, he was fucked up. Oh, my God. You saw that motherfucker at McDonald's in the goddamn play lab waiting no kids? You saw that motherfucker. Okay. Think he'll ever get out? I don't know, man. I don't know. I, dude, you know, people ask me as a DJ, you still going to play R. Kelly? Yeah, I'm going to play the motherfucker's music. Okay. I'm going to still play his music. I wouldn't hire the motherfucker for a babysitter, but <laughs> <laughs> he can't babysit my dog, but... 
the nigga, well, look, man, look, check this out. Think about this for a minute, man. Since R. Kelly's been gone, music been really fucked up. If only motherfucker we got making any real hits these days is Bruno Mars. I mean, R&B hits. Yeah, right, right. Okay? Bruno Mars and uh, what's his name? A Anderson Pack. Pac. Mm -hmm. Okay? Other than that, dude, it's kind of weak out here. Okay? All the people that was making the good, the, the national hits like Prince, gone. Michael, gone. Okay? I still be bumping Prince. Bro. Okay? You and me both, man. All these people that was making the shit, you know, making the good hits. Uh, Isley Brothers making hits back in the 70s, but he hooked up with R. Kelly, brought them all back again. Brought them all back, Okay, yeah. same thing with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Charlie Wilson. Brought Snoop, them all yeah. back again. Yeah. Okay? Dude, without, without, that dude's a, he's a very talented dude. He wasn't shit as a babysitter, but he was a talented motherfucker, man. And yeah. to see him you know, go down like that when you got guys like uh, Hugh Hefner that gets praised for doing the same shit. I know, I know. Did, did you ever watch, I don't know if it's a little bit off topic, but since we're talking about R. Kelly, you ever see that Jeffrey Epstein documentary? Yeah. Okay. The guy was a fucking monster. I, I'm not even going to argue that, okay? Uh, and I believe, well, let me say, I think he got taken out. You know what okay. I'm saying? You know, I'm on the same, I'm in the same you know. poop. Thoughts of you. So, so um, here's what gets me. They interview these girls, and some of these girls like, uh, they ask him, did he ever touch you? Uh, no. Did he ever have sex with you? No. What did he want? He just wanted me to give him, a, 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 I guess, a rub while he was naked. Right. Uh, okay. He goes, but the things that I wouldn't do, I would bring other girls for. How long did you stay? Five years. The fuck? <laughs> you know, that reminds me of this dude. Uh, he, he filed, he's filing a lawsuit. I forgot, I forgot the guy's name. He's filing a lawsuit saying he was being raped. He started being raped at, at, uh, he started being raped at 16. And he just found a loss of the 26, and he just got through fucking this guy not long ago. Okay? <laughs> He's he, he, he been, he been with this guy for 10 years, whatever the case may be. He's been molesting you for 10 years. No, motherfucker, you like that shit. Yeah, you were there. You, That's some bullshit. It's some bullshit. I That's know. some bullshit. Okay. All right, here, we're going to get into something that um, is going around right now, and you guys actually touched on it. Yeah. And I'm glad you guys touched on it. And it's this uh, whole Tiger song. You know, I don't think he'll ever fucking watch, but I hope somebody's watching that forwards it to him. Uh, um, and you guys titled it, it's Tiger new video, disrespectful to the Latino community. Okay. Um, I saw the video. A lot of people sent it to me and he's got this. Uh, I don't know if he's supposed I to be. I saw it too. Yeah. yeah. All, it, all type of Latino yeah. uh, stereotypes. You know, it, there's one thing that stood out to me that I saw another podcaster mention. And he said, in the movie Malcolm X, Denzel plays a part where he has a white girl kiss his toe. And he likened it to a video where he has a Latina, uh, I guess, licking hot sauce off of right. his toes or right. whatever. He goes, so he kind of likened it to that. And he goes, and then it's raining chips. And then he's eating chips. And then he's wearing certain type of like, you know, um, um, a bullfighter suit or right. whatever. You, you know, my thing is this. When I first saw the the first um, YG video local, okay. I took it offensive because th there were um, he was he was wearing a mariachi suit, and I knew certain dudes that I know that were there at the video, and they thought it was they thought it was dope. They thought like he's putting us on. Okay, that's what they were saying. Okay. So I said like, well, how's he putting us on? Well, he loves our culture so much. So and then I said, okay, cool. So I asked him this. I said, okay, so he loves our culture so much. He said, if I wanted to appeal to the black community, what, what, what would I be saying or how should I dress to appeal to the black community? And he said this, and, and along with another chick, well, no, you can't do that. That'll be racist. And I said, okay, L let me come back to that. I had an actor here one time, his name's Noel G. He's been on uh, Fast and the Furious and many other movies. And he said, said it on here. He said, in Hollywood, there's only two names for Chicano actors. It's uh, Hector and Carlos. Hector and Carlos. So I asked him, can you imagine in the back, black community, if you wanted to be an actor, you only had two choices. You got Jamal and Tyrone. Okay. There would be an uproar. Okay. Because that's racism. Okay. And I said, why aren't our people saying anything about this? So then we back to YG, he's, he's get this, uh, he hires some SA dudes from the, from the Valley. I interviewed those guys. Okay. And they told me that 
he wouldn't even talk to them. And I said, so you guys were just cholos for hire? And he said, pretty much. And I said, how are you going to hire real dudes from the neighborhood to be in your video and you don't even talk to them? Hmm. So that's another side that I took offensive. And then comes uh, 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 the Carne Sada video with uh, um, Blueface. Okay. He did a song called Carne Sada. He's got a, a Chicana girl and he's slapping uh, Carne Sada on her ass. You know? Then we got this song. Now, how ironic that Tygo was already on YG and YG caught he, heat for his song Loco, but yet he wants to come out with another song called Ay Caramba. My thing is this. So here's where I laid out to you, Lonzo. If if I wanted to appeal to the black community, what do I have to, what should I wear and what should I dress like to appeal to you guys? <sighs> A real dude? Yeah. Just be yourself for me, man. Yeah, just be yourself. Just correct? be yourself, okay? Okay. You you call me not because you're trying to be black, because you Tony A. <laughs> okay? You ain't got to be you ain't got to be nobody special. Right. Um, if you was trying to had your hair braided or eating watermelon, I might not be sitting here. Okay. He's, but you see what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. Okay. Um, but understand this. In in today's um media uh platform, yes. it ain't about the quality of the music. Okay. It's the controversy that you can create behind the music. And I saw that video this morning. It was at 3.9 million views. Okay? That means that YouTube is going to send him a check. Yes. Okay? Yes. Them views is going to send him a check. Yes. That controversy is going to make him, make people, more people go to watch that video. And one thing about, we both know about these videos and yes. shit like this, whether it's a like or a dislike, it's a view. They don't it's give a, a damn whether, whether yeah. you like it or not. It's still considered as a view. Mm -hmm. So if you got a million some odd views, because you got some controversial shit. Right. And as you very well know, trying to build a YouTube channel and be a straight shooter is a little difficult. Yes. Okay? But if you want to sell out and be a, you know, cuss people out and talk about a bunch of bullshit, you'll blow the fuck up. I'm only right. at, I'm just, I'm just almost at 13,000. I've done my shit for about three years now. Okay? Because I refuse to do dumb shit. Okay? Yes. yes. If I can't drop some knowledge or some real information, I'm not going to do it. I'm too old for that shit, right. man. But you got guys who need some attention, and the music is the. the, the uh, so you, uh, I saw I, I was Akilamba, 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 yeah. Akilamba. I saw it this morning because I knew you were going to ask me about it. I watched it this morning. I watched it, uh, peeped it out uh, clips of it when we and Dusty did the show, but I didn't really watch the whole thing. Right. And I saw he, he was a bullfighter. He was a lowrider. He was all uh, he was all type of uh, mariachis or whatever. And if if somebody else did that. It would be a major problem if if uh, if uh, Kid Frost or uh, my boy, uh, come on, uh, my other brother, come on, man, um, you know, uh, damn. If Kid Frost did the shit wearing dreads or some shit like that, it would be a fucking problem. Okay, it, yeah, it, it, would, would. it would be it would be considered disrespectful. Now, some cats say would say he would be it would be cool with some people, but overall, the controversy would be enough. To run up a bunch of views, make some money, and here's the crazy part about it: it's controversial today. By the end of the month, won't be won't be a subject, and that's the problem with music. Yeah, the the music is no longer the focal point; it's the antics that the artists can do to get views and get people to look at this shit and maybe download it. Because the song is not a great song; it's an no. okay song, but it's not a great song. He ain't saying shit. Right. He ain't saying shit. Everything is in the visuals. It goes right back to my boy, um, uh, Old Town Road. What's the guy's name? Uh, little, little, little Nas, Nas X. X. Yeah. His last video was, the music was garbage, but the video was him sliding down on the devil and doing all kind of shit. <laughs> Got all kind of views. Lap dancing, kissing the dude the whole nine yards. So it's not about the music no more. It's about the video, the antics that the artist can do to create the controversy, to get people to go to YouTube, to look at the video, right. and rent, r roll them views up. Right. Get them views up, four or five million views. That's a nice little check, man. Yeah. Do, now, let me ask you, do you believe, oh, in your opinion, let me say it this way, do you believe that he did it ignorantly or he knew what he was doing? He knew what he was doing. Dude, this is, this is, this is just a, a cultural version of what the Kashi 69 does. It's a cultural version of the same thing Lil Nas X does. They, um, in one way, you're, you're trying to appeal to the Latino community, but you're also dissing them. But you're also trying to make it like it's, it's funny 
But you also, it's a diss, okay? It is. If, if, if he if he came off the Frito Bandito, they had to kill the Frito Bandito for the same, they killed the Chihuahua and Taco Bell for the same reason. Right. It was, it was disrespectful, and people know that shit. And, and right. They do it just for the controversy. Say, Lonzo, and I, I'm glad what you said earlier, he goes, if you, well, let me give you my example. Say uh, tomorrow I make a video and I, uh, I call it I Love Watermelon. And I paint myself black and I wear an African mm -hmm. outfit and I'm slapping black girls, you know, in the booty with a piece of the chicken. Okay. I'm drink, I'm chewing hubba bubba uh, watermelon red, red gum. Yeah, swimming in a pool of red Kool-Aid. Right. Okay. You wouldn't be sitting right here. Nah, that wouldn't be cool. Okay. And, and there's a possibility that I might even get fucked up or killed. Okay. And we wouldn't like it. But we, I, would, I wouldn't kill you, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you get my, my, get my you, point. Get See, and that's the way we feel because we feel like we love the black culture. We love black music. We support it. And for us to have that happen to us, we just feel that it has to stop. I can, I can understand that. Okay. I can understand that. Okay. okay. Now, here's something I got to say. Okay. Yes. <sighs> My grandkids, yes. you're half Latino. Yeah. Okay. My oldest son married a Latino girl. My youngest son loves Latino women. Okay. But they love them from a, from a respectful standpoint. Yes. Okay. It's, it's the, the two cultures live side by side. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're in a council culture <laughs> in one way, but in, 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 the, in the desperation for attention, We'll, we'll cross that line to get some attention. Mm -hmm. And I don't see, he didn't do anything. He, he did something that's offensive, but it's, let me see, how, how, how can I put this? Because some people, because I, I, I got, and I spoke about it, some people loved it. Latino people loved it. I'm a Latino guy, blah, blah, blah. I thought it was great, whoop, 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 okay? Yeah. Uh, but a lot of people don't understand the long-term ramifications of stuff like that, yeah. okay? Because if she was on the other foot, everybody'd be pissed off, okay? Yes. You'd have Al Sharpton coming out here. He'd be out in the alley and shit, marching and shit on the goddamn podcast. It's true. It's okay? true. How could Tony A do some shit like that, okay? So you you have to respect everybody's culture, man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, some of our cultures intertwine. The lowriders, we all love lowriders. Absolutely. Okay? It, but you have to do it respectfully. Um, shit, Nelly got canceled because he, he took a credit card and swiped down a girl's ass. Remember that shit? Yes. He had to deal with Pepsi. Gone. It was a black girl. Okay, so again, everybody is trying to figure out what the line is, and they don't find out what the line is till they crossed it. By that time, it's almost it's almost easier to apologize than it is to ask for permission. You follow me? Yeah. They it, oh I'm, I'm apologize, but meanwhile you got them you got them four or five million views. You made the money already. Okay, you yeah. shouldn't did it in the first place. Right, right. You know, easy e. On Dope Man. Who is it? Uh, uh, I got something, man. Oh, yeah, what do you got? Oh, I got this gold chain. Oh, yeah, man, y'all Mexicans always coming with this shit. We felt that shit. And I'm going to tell you why, Lonzo. Okay. Because I live right here in the city of Wilmas. I grew up here my whole life. Okay. okay? I know dudes from the east, and I know dudes from the west. I never sold to, uh, to uh, uh, Mexican crackheads. Okay. So when I heard that, and he kind of sounded like a Latino, I'm like, the fuck? When he said, you were Mexicans? So, now, let's put the shoe on the other foot. Who is it? Yo, what's up, man? It's Jamal. What you want, Jamal? I got this gold chain. Man, you black people always coming with this. It'd be a problem. It'd be a problem. I, okay. I get you. I get you. And I know that, Lonzo, and that's why I love our conversations, bro. You know, because I can express myself to you. I appreciate you, that. You know, it'll be a problem. So, when I met Easy, that was one of the questions that he asked me. Mm. Hey, did you have an issue with that? I said, yeah. I said, matter of fact, my whole neighborhood had an issue with that mm. and he was like okay you know i just got you know i got love for mexicans and i was like yeah i know but it didn't sound like it and he goes mm. well i'm just sharing who i used to sell to okay so he told me that he shared his experience so if that's his experience then okay, okay. then you know like to be honest with you out here i sold to blacks and i sold to whites i was just a nickel and dimer i was not a mm. big time dude okay you know so i sold to blacks and whites i, I never really sold to rasa because at least out here in this and out here in my community um, there was never any uh, a Chicano lease, uh, you know, crackheads. Oh, shit. 
out, out here. I'm not talking about okay. just okay. a woman. Okay. okay, maybe they went somewhere else and bought okay. it. Okay, okay, you know. But um, and then there was another part where he said, "Because the Mexican almost wrecked my shit," mm. you know. And I remember that, and I I quoted those lyrics. And I know some people probably get mad at what I'm, what I'm about to say, but you know what kind of balanced that out for me? Mm. At the very end of Dope Man, hey, Mr. Dope Man, you think you're slick. You sold crack to my sister, but now she's sick. But if she happens to die because of your drug, I'm putting in your culo a 38 slug. Right, right. And you know what? To a certain extent, we feel honored that he actually recognized our culture and even put somewhat of our language mm. in one of his songs. Okay. Okay. 100 Miles and Running, if you listen to the very end, he had somebody... Uh, of cuss, cursing somebody out in Spanish. So if you look at Easy E's last days, he signed a bunch of Latinos. Okay. So he loved Raza. Yeah. I don't have nothing against Easy. If you walk in, you see Easy's picture right there. Okay. Okay. I love that dude. He wrapped on my mixtapes. But when he asked me about it, I addressed it. Mm. You know, my thing is this with guys like Tygo or YG or whatever, I reached out to YG's management when he first came out with the song and he said, he, they said he's not doing no interviews. So at least with easy, he at least, I don't want to say he'd give me an interview because this was in the eighties. He at least spoke to me about it. And I respected that. And just like I respect you because you came out here and you talked to me about it. So I'm thankful for that. Now, so. we, we had a conversation about tiger and uh, YG in dresses. They did a video dressed up like two white girls in, in, in Beverly Hills, just a couple of, about a month or so ago. YG. Yeah. Okay, see that I didn't know. YG and, and Tiger, I think it was YG and Tiger, and uh, they both was in the convertible, you know, and dresses and shit, doing all, you know, doing this Hollywood thing, and that just when when I saw this video, it just reconfirmed what I already said. At some point in time, the videos become more important than the actual music because the visuals pay just as much yeah. as the audio. So if you do wow. a controversial video, you can't do you can't do sex. Okay. Right, right. Can't do sex, so you do something that's going to get you some controversy, and you be all you get all the blo all the blogs, all the fucking video shows. Everybody's talking about you, and everybody's right. going to send traffic to your YouTube channel. Yes. So people, your your numbers go up, just just like with uh WAP, uh, WAP, uh with WAP with uh, Cardi B and WAP. Mm -hmm. The video was so wild that that bitch was like thirty million views. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a nice that's a nice fucking check. Yes. Okay. So. You, you do a, you do a dope video or uh, a controversial video, and you get a dope check, okay? <laughs> and here it is a year later, the shit's forgotten about. And this is this is the time we live in, Doc. Yeah. You know the videos are so cheaply done; it, it's it's so inexpensively inexpensive to do a video these days. Back when I was doing videos, twenty five grand at least. At least, I mean, you had to do it on film. I mean, you couldn't fuck up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now they do it on digital cameras, digital uh, fucking digital files. You can fuck up, re erase the shit, and do it over again. It's no yeah. big deal. By the way, a lot of people when uh, um, when they found out on that Dr. Dre and surgery when you were playing the keyboard, remember yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. You would tell me you actually admitted to me that you didn't play not one note. I ain't played not one fucking note. And you were on the video playing that shit. I'm gonna tell you this, and I'm gonna give you flowers, and I'm gonna stick up for you. Lonzo looked fucking fly on that motherfucking video. Straight <laughs> up. He looked fucking fly. And let me tell you something. I would have done the same shit, homeboy. Okay. Thank you. I would have done the same shit. So you go, oh, I don't know why Lonzo's in the... Because he wanted to be in the motherfucking look, video. Look, man, hold on. Let me tell you something. As a kid, I grew up on The Temptations. Hell yeah. Michael Jackson, Jackson 5, all that shit, right? All that I did. I couldn't sing a motherfucking note. When hip-hop came around... I financed my group so I could be in the motherfucker. I didn't do it because I wanted Dre to blow up. Shit. That was for me. I went for him. But I, fuck him. I wasn't trying to be, I wasn't trying to do it for him. I was doing it for me. Yes. That was my fucking dream. Yes, yes. Okay? And like I said before, as a kid, as a young man was making money, I wanted to finance one of my fucking dreams. Yes. And that was to be in my own fucking group. Yes. And do some choreography and wear some suits. And because I wasn't a lead rapper, we scratching. Uh, Dre, was a, Dre was a motherfucking scratch, uh, DJ. Yeah. Clientele or Shakespeare was the lead rappers. Yeah. Me and Yellow was kind of backup. Okay. Yeah. So Yellow was, he, every, every, once, every once in a while, Yellow would play the drums or he played timbales or um, DJ. What the fuck Lonzo gonna do? Yeah. This ain't the temptation where I gotta go ooh and ah, fuck that. Yeah, okay? no, 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 no. So I, was, I, watched, I watched some old Elvis videos. Really? 
I watched some old Elvis videos. And something about Elvis, you think about this. You ain't never seen Elvis do a fucking solo in your life. All the time Elvis got a guitar, he ain't never did a solo. He doing this shit with that motherfucker. You're right. Okay? He doing this shit, right? Yes. And my pot, my, my manager said, Elvis don't play a guitar. Elvis just doing, he holds that motherfucker. <laughs> okay? He just holds that motherfucker. You ain't never heard a, a song featuring Elvis on the guitar. You ain't never, after a while, he get a guitar away, start singing. Was that genius of him? That was, that was genius. <laughs> That's why Lonzo borrowed this shit. Okay? I'll tell you another secret. <laughs> Before I had the bass, before I had the bass, uh, I had the keyboard. I had the bass guitar. Okay. Okay. And we had a song on an album called World Class, and we hired a professional bass player to come in, and it was a, so, it was a solo on that. Boom, 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 ba doom, ba doom. And, and in the beginning, I took a bass guitar on road with, on the road with us, and yes. I was to play. I would finger the bass lines, right? Bass wasn't plugged up as shit. All right. <laughs> now, World Class Wrecking Crew in the beginning. We toured with a gang of bands. We toured with uh, Mary Jane Girls, SOS Band, Surfers, uh, More Stay in the Time. Yo, man. So here you are. We the opening act, right? It's time for sound check. Okay? They say, hey, tell your bass player, come do a sound check. I never did a sound check. <laughs> How's this motherfucker playing the bass without the goddamn sound check? Okay? <laughs> that's, why, that's why I had to change up to the goddamn keyboard. Because, you know, you, a bass player got to tune the strings up. Right. Now, I ain't know how to tune that motherfucker up. <laughs> what no amp. It's how this motherfucker playing without an amp, okay? So I got sus- suspicion. Then I, I had a glove. I played with a glove, a, my, my, my black glove. Uh-huh. I had a glove on, too. So motherfucker like, how is this motherfucker playing a bass with a goddamn glove? He don't tune up. He don't do a sound check, and he got a glove on. Oh, this motherfucker's bullshit. So I changed it. I got rid of that shit and got the keyboard. <laughs> and I had the keyboard back then. They didn't have a wireless MIDI, so I had to run a cord. Oh. I plug it up and just tied. I tied a cord. I tied a cord to the other end of the, to the to the rack back there. It just it was a cord run out the back. I just tied it to the rack so motherfucker could see me. And I I had my area. Where I walked. It. I had a fifty foot MIDI cord. I just kept that motherfucker. And I did my little <laughs> area. And one night we was playing at the. Um, never forget we was playing at the Long Beach Sports Arena. It was a date of the matinee show. It was us, Fourth MDs. Uh, Rapping, Force MDs, oh my God! Rapping Duke, tears, and uh, now, uh, hey, what what was Rapping Duke? Was he a white guy or a black guy? Black dude. He sounded just white, dude. Yeah, he was a good John John Wayne impersonator. Duh, 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 Fuck. So we doing the show. I forgot who the other groups were, and uh, it came time to do my part on uh for a world class, and I'm doo doo doo. I'm figuring figuring the shit. And for some reason, somehow or another, my cord came loose. And I'm right here on the edge of the stage. And some little kid, hey, mister, your cord came out. I'm like, motherfucker, shut up. I'm still playing. I damn it. And I was like, how's this motherfucker playing at the cord in this motherfucker? <laughs> oh, it was crazy. So eventually, you know, it, I had to put that motherfucker down because I kept getting busted. See, today you can say it's Bluetooth. Yeah. yeah I, I can say it. I tried using it again. Me and clients here started doing shows. I tried to use, use a Bluetooth uh, controller. That motherfucker kept fucking up, so <laughs> I don't use it no more. I just fuck it. But oh, uh, yeah, man, man, it was it was a wrecking crew was a dream I had, man. It was it was my vision. I brought them into it. That shit's dope, man. Okay. Uh, since you brought up Elvis, I have to ask you: Did you watch the Elvis movie? Not yet. No. Okay. Well, honestly, watch it. And I'm gonna tell you why. On a scale of one to ten, my son gave it a nine. I give it an eight. Okay. Okay. I'm not gonna overhype it, but one thing that I did love. And I'm going to tell you why I loved it. Because growing up, I had people tell me that Elvis was such an original artist. He wrote all of his songs and played all of his instruments. I don't know where in the fuck they got that from. Okay. Then I started reading a little bit of his biographies because I do a lot of reading. And he didn't play shit. Okay. Didn't write shit. He learned from a lot of black artists. But yes. 90%. Right. In this movie, they actually show where he got his dancing his music and his songs from all mm. black artists. And they show a lot of B.B. King. Right. Where him and B.B. King were friends. And B.B. King was like saying, you know, if you do that song, that song will hit. And he goes, why don't you do it? He said, it won't hit with me. I'm black. You're white. It'll hit. Mm. They said it just like that in the movie. And mm. I was glad that they said that, bro. Because wow. that is true. Wow. That is true. And he showed up when he got his dancing and uh, uh, like his music. Because Hound Dog and Joe House Rock was sung by black people before right. him. Right. You know? He just took it because he was a white guy right. and he hit. Right. 
you know? That was very popular back then. Yes, right. yes. And and I was glad because I love to give people their credit. I love to give people their flowers. So, and the guy who played the Elvis actually played a great job. Okay. I, so, I recommend it. I think I think I will, I will you enjoy it. it. I, I plan on checking it. I just haven't had a chance to yet. Yeah, I know. I, I, so there's, there's days that I just turn on TV and I'm like, okay, let me watch this. Uh, I think I went to the movies. I only go to the movies maybe once a year. So far, I've gone twice. I used to go every Friday, man. I used to go every Friday. Before, really? Before I had, when I had the club, before COVID. Oh, okay. Before I, before I go to the club, I'd go uh, to a matinee every Friday. Whatever was out, I'd just go see it. Now, let me ask you this, Lonzo. Be honest. Go ahead. Do you go by yourself? Yeah, all the time. Same here? All the time. Why would it be mad at the motherfucker? We're going to go right inside that motherfucker. Why you go? Because right, your ass is at work. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's cheaper. Shit. <laughs> I got fucking popcorn, hot dog, candy, and a Coke, and I'm there by myself sitting in the middle. Yes, yes. Nobody around. I mean, sometimes I go to the theater, it'd be me and three other people. Sometimes it'd be me by myself, depending on what I pick out to go see. Yes. You know, so, uh, and like I said, the, the tickets are cheaper. Uh, the tickets be like, well, they used to be like $7. Now they're like 8 or 9 I get, yeah. to see, I get to see the Cinder Discount. Seems- <laughs> I get to see the Cinder Discount. What about the record crew discount? You don't get no record nah, crew? Nah, I get, I get to get the old man discount. But fuck him, I take it. Um... And uh, I still give me a hot dog or some shit like that. I go to somebody to give me a hot dog. I ain't give you eight dollars for a hot dog. Fuck that. You know, fuck what time eight, it is. Eight dogs. Yeah. You, know, you know what's funny? How motherfuckers today complain about gas. Now gas is high, but yo, they'll go to Dodger Stadium and for a fucking tall can they'll pay fourteen, fifteen bucks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, give me three of them. Yeah, motherfucker, you you complaining about gas, but yet you blowing your money over here. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, can't, it, I can't do that. Like I was telling my son, my son, he, he don't he he'll never under he'll never know. Gas cheaper than four fifty a gallon. He just started driving last year. Oh, and he started okay. driving before before it jumped up. It was like four fifty before you know before, right. before the pandemic or whatever. And by the time, because I remember gas being thirty seven cents a gallon, dude. Thirty seven cents. Thirty seven cents. I've been driving since the seventies, dude. Look it up. When wow. it, when they when they put that tax on it, it went to seventy five cent shortly after that. Okay, wow. but I remember at one point in time, I could go to the gas station. And put in a dollar and a quarter and get three gallons of gas. Wow. My dad had a lawn cutting service. We would take five dollars and fill up all the lawnmowers, the gas can, and put gas in the truck. Five dollars. Wow. I'm gonna share one story. It was in the seventies. Um, I was met probably about nine or ten years old. I was born in sixty eight. Okay. So I was it was prob I was probably nine or ten years old. I lived in Compton till I was nine, then we moved out here. When I was, yeah, till I was nine. Okay. So I was about 19 years old. My dad used to give my allowance. Uh, I don't know, do people still give allowances? Yeah. Okay. They give a job these days. But yeah. go ahead. <laughs> he gave me a dollar. And to, to me, a dollar was a whole, okay. you know. I used to go to the liquor store and I used to buy one of them small Cokes and bottle small Cokes, a bag of barbecue Fritos. They don't have no more barbecue, just I think it's chili cheese or some bullshit. Right, right. Maybe a Snickers and get like 15 cents change. Yeah. But my dollar. Okay. I got you beat. <laughs> share, share that, please. I would take 50 cent. We would go to the store where, where, where Vanguard Junior High School is, where I used to go to school at, right? Junior High School. Mm-hmm. There's some apartments there now. There used to be a grocery store there. Okay? Mm-hmm. I would take 50 cents and go buy a bunch of penny candies at lunchtime. I, I, had, I lived right down the street. Yes. I had a lunch pass. I'd go home for lunch. I'd run home, grab me a sandwich, go to the liquor store. And for fifty cents, I could buy all kinds of shit and come back to school and double my money. You buy a sandwich? No, no, no. I go home and eat. Okay, <laughs> go to the grocery store and buy buy penny candies and double my money. Sell shit for nickels, whatever. They had those. Uh, the, the, um, they had they used to have a big ass tray of candy, like toff, toff, toffee and shit like that. Yeah, and they sold it by the pound. Oh, I remember that they shit. Sold it by the pound. You just, Caramel, butterscotch, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You buy you buy about a fucking pound, might have been a quarter for a fucking pound, okay? Yeah. And then you know, even then, if I didn't buy that, I can go. They had a fifteen cent soda, had uh, fucking zingers with like thirteen, fourteen cents, okay? And a bag of potato chips, all that shit might, it might cost you forty five cents, man. Today a co- bottle of coke is like two fifty. Right, zingers is two dollars and fifty cent too. Fuck. Fucking zinger. They still three of them little motherfuckers. I still eat them from time to time. <laughs> Oh, good, Lonzo. I used to love Ding Dongs, man. Ding, ding Dongs is $2, man. Ding Dongs used to be 50 motherfucking cent. Ding Dongs. They, they look like hockey pucks. The, the, the round yes, ones. yes. I love the motherfuckers, man. The, those are bombs. I used to love them. I can't fuck with them anymore. They, 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 man, they, they too, make, make a motherfucker too fat. I want to give a shout out once again before we uh, bounce. Um, 
I want to give a shout out to somebody that I love, somebody that's very dear to me, and I know he's very dear to you too, Alonzo. And this is where we have a mutual friend. We have a lot of mutual friends, Violet, Steviano, et cetera, Calvin Anderson, uh, but my boy, Keith Yellow Ice. Mm, come on, man. Come on. I, I didn't know you knew Yellow Ice, man. Yeah, you, you know what? I, I'm trying to remember my boy's name that, came with, that came with Yellow. Right, right. He came with Yellow. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, his name was Lonzo, too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking. Big and uh, I was going through some pictures, and he goes, stop right there. And, and I was like, what's up? And he goes, who's that right there? And I go, oh, that's my boy Keith. And he goes, you know Keith? And I said, yeah. And he went, I'm going to see. And he called him. Yeah. He called him, and he goes, hey, it's a guy named Tony A.C. He, Keith said, that's my brother. He said, oh, really? And he goes, that's my brother right there, man. And we were talking, and he goes, Tone, I'm going to call you tomorrow. I've been knowing Keith for over 20 years, bro. So, And I know you've known him a lo lot longer. You grew up with him. Keith, so. uh, at Eve After Dark, Yellow Ice, uh, he kept gangbangers in line for me. Yeah. You know, I first opened the Eve. He said, Lionel, I like what you're doing, man. I know this ain't your, you know, the gangbanger thing ain't your shit. If anybody fuck with your shit, mm -hmm. let me know. I got it, okay? And a couple times, motherfuckers was talking about doing some shit. And he, uh, Yellow Ice, this is what I heard. Don't worry about it, Lionel. And we ain't never had a problem. Never had a problem. Yeah, I saw their brother at another one of, one of our mutual friends' funeral not long ago, and uh, he ain't changed, man. He's it he was a different guy now. He's he's, he's a born again Christian. Yeah, uh, different dude, but he still got the same respect. He's still big as a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> he's sixty years old. He's still big as a motherfucker. Okay, and uh, I credit a lot of the shit that didn't happen to Eve after dark because our relationship. You know what I think now, man. I think yesterday was his birthday. Oh, what? I, I think he's turned sixty-two or sixty-one. I'm gonna call him. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I don't. I know he took off to the Bahamas with his girl. Okay, okay. So, okay. but man. I see him at church all the time, man. That's why. That's we. That's we reconnected at. He, he. We went to the same church over in Carson for a while, but uh, it ain't, ain't nothing but love, man. Yeah, ain't nothing man. but love, dude. Yeah. So, and, and you know what? For the people that may not know, and I know you can confirm this, he is one of the original, uh, uh, Pyro Street. Yeah. He was one of the original Pyro Boys. I thought, you know, because he was younger, I thought he was sec second. You know, none of those. I was right there with putting in the rest of them. Yeah. Okay. He said he said he was, he was at the park when they were going to jump on us. That's who, that's why I had a problem with Pyro Boys. Yeah. Okay. He was He said he was there. He wasn't. You know, he wasn't one of the guys we would have a problem with. Right. 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 But he was there. Okay. Yeah. And he remembered that shit. And yeah. he said, "Man, you know, I remember when that shit happened. And you know, I it was this, Kenny Clay was my partner, lived in my block." He came from New York, and he was a little tough dude. This motherfucker could fight his ass off. And uh, in fact, one time in school at Vanguard, him and another guy was going got into a fight. And the fight was like it was the fight was such a big deal at the school. Yeah. So the teachers watched the motherfucker. The gym teacher let him fight. Okay. Oh well, shit. We behind the fucking Van Vanguard had a uh, had a. We had out outdoor basketball courts. Uh huh. So we had the teachers outside. Yeah. And it was like watching a goddamn. Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier bout <laughs> until uh, uh, till one, one one of the vice principals got wind of it and they finally broke it up. And this don't do no shit, dude. I mean, this this is this is the era I grew up in. Yes, sir. Yeah. It, it, my era was so crazy. The last two weeks of gym, we couldn't dress for gym no more. They turned out they, they stopped getting the towels and shit, right? We used to get naked, had to take a shower and right. shit, all that shit in school. Yeah. They cut off the towel service two weeks before school, but to keep us busy, they let us box. Okay, they would let us fucking box. They had a pair of boxing gloves. They made a fucking ring, and we had two two gym classes: Mr. Kuakawa, the Asian dude, and Mr. Meacham. Okay, in the ninth grade, by the time I got to the ninth grade, I was, I was playing soft, playing baseball. I was a catcher. Okay, and because I was a catcher, I learned how to keep my eyes open yes. when shit goes in front of my face. Yes. Well, the average motherfucker in the ninth grade closes his eyes and swing. Okay. Yes. I fucked around, became the class champion. Okay, of my class. Okay. Now, my other partner was in another another guy I had a problem with in the eighth grade. He was a champion of his class. Okay. Now we had. Now I didn't won. I won the championship for my class. And I and I'm not a motherfucking boxer, but I just know how to keep my eyes open. Yes. I know how the basic skills. Of, I'm not a motherfucking black belt. I'm not a fucking fighter. But 
At that time, I had yeah. a little edge over the average cat in the ninth grade. Absolutely. Because you learn how to keep your eyes open. How to keep my eyes open while you fight. And okay. you know what? That's one thing that a boxer must learn. You got to. Because you, you, can, you can't duck what you can't see. So I'm ducking. I'm, I'm bop, bop, bop. And me and a guy that had a, I had a problem in the eighth grade, he was a champion in fifth class. Okay? Mm. So they had a championship. They're going to unify the classes. So me and him got it. This dude was smaller than me. Right. Okay? And whatever happened, man, we was boxing. We was doing pretty good. And somebody rem- reminded him that I had knocked the fuck out of him in the eighth grade. <laughs> hey, Ray, remember when he fucked you up in the eighth grade? And this guy's guy's eyes, eyes got big and beat the shit out of me, okay? Oh, shit. They had to teach you to pull him off of me, okay? But the crazy part about this is me and this dude are still friends right to this fucking day. We both 65 years old. Okay. Wow. I didn't go get a gun and kill this motherfucker. Okay. Yeah. I didn't want to fight him no more, but I didn't go kill his ass either. Yeah. So I try to tell this story, man, because so many youngsters can't take a fucking L. No, they can't. Okay. Dude, a L stands for less. A L stands for li- for life and for lessons. Okay. A L stands for lessons. You learn something. It stands for learning. You gonna learn something. Take an L. You gonna live. You take an L. Okay. And I'm not saying that a motherfucker stomp you out, but an ass whooping ain't, a, going back to that show, an ass whooping ain't but a lesson, a hard lesson to learn, okay? And I, that, that, that's something I, these cats don't understand, because a lot of these guys don't have pops around to teach them, hey, man, stop running. Fight a motherfucker, okay? Fight a motherfucker, yeah. Fight a exactly. motherfucker, okay? If you get your ass whooped, go home, put ice on your eye and go home, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I tell you what, the motherfucker respect you for not running. If you run, every time you see, you're going to rob your ass. Yeah, you, you know, I remember, I, like I said, I was probably eight or nine years old. My brother used to take me to a gym in Compton. My oldest brother, he's probably about your age, uh, um, because I have five brothers and four sisters. I'm okay. one of ten kids. Okay. And he used to take me to a gym in Compton, and he used to teach me how to jab, 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 and I'm going to say a boxing gym. And then he taught me how to jab left, right. And you know what's funny? Lonzo, even though I'm right-handed, yeah. I fight left-handed. Oh, no shit. I've always fought left-handed. The other day, my son, he was like, you know what, Dad? Uh, I need to learn some ba- basic boxing skills. And I said, okay, stand up, show me. And he went like this. And I go, you, you left your face up. wide open. You're going to get fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> so I stood left-handed, and I kept jabbing and kept jabbing. And I go, what are you doing? Because he kept, what the fuck? Like, uh. he left himself wide open. So I was teaching him. But he was like, Dad, it's just that I need to learn how to fight. Uh. You know what I'm saying? So... I didn't sock his ass up, but right, I taught right, him how to move right, a little, right, just a little right. bit, especially from a left-hander. Okay. Because left-handers do everything opposite, now, bro. I'm funny you should say that because in the, in my championship, the guy I almost lost to was fucking left-handed, okay? <laughs> the guy I almost lost to, I couldn't figure out why this motherfucker kept sticking my ass, okay? <laughs> he was knocking the shit out of my ass, and it wasn't until the second round, he, he said he's fucking left-handed. Oh, shit! I got to watch the other hand now, yes. okay? And that's how they would have beat his dad. Other than that, I was going to get fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Left-handers do everything all different. But yeah. So, other than that, Lonzo, anything you want to promote? Anything I didn't ask you? Anything you want to share? Anything you want to say? Um, me, clientele, and Yella okay, have gotten yes. back together, man. Um, Yella was born again Christian. Uh, me and clientele, have been always, we've always been rock, rocking together for the last five, five or six years. And uh, Yella has joined us again. You know, he, um, I ain't saying denounce NWA. He just don't feel that spirit no more. Yes. And uh, we've been doing book signings and shows. We were in Sacramento yesterday. Just got back today. Um, and we have all have books. All of them available on Amazon. Mine is called NWA Stories with Lonzo. Uh, Yellow's is called Straight Outta Compton. And Clientele is, I think it's called Clientele the Renaissance Man. Um, I'm also the president of the Compton Entertainment Chamber of Commerce, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's something I'm doing now. I'm working with the city of Compton to bring entertainment and also build a Compton Walk of Fame, okay? Compton Walk of Fame. Compton Walk of Fame. Compton, the Compton people, here's the crazy part about Compton. I I joined a a group called the Compton 125 Historical Society. Compton has a history that's deep as fuck, but nobody knows about it. It's like it's a fucking secret. What's the first group out of Compton you could think of? Wrecking Crew? Okay. No. No, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Before I answer that, please allow me to say this. Not rap. I'm going to say something else. It's not a a rap group. Okay. I said this, and somebody from Long Beach got upset at me, and I love my homie. But I said some of the 
the best DJs, the best rappers, the best producers, and the best pop lockers all came out of Compton. That's okay. what I said. Okay. Okay. Now, when you said the, you know, okay. Wrecking Crew, the next one was Todd T, Mixed Master Spade. Okay. All wrong. Okay. The first group out of Compton that had a hit record was yeah. fucking War. It was War. Okay. War. Fucking oh. high, Compton High School. Okay. They all came out of high, Compton High School. Okay, now, now, Lonzo, you were there from day one, so I have to ask you this because different people told me different things because I know War had many, many, uh, um, uh, if you will, members. Okay. okay. Some people say, it's a group out of Long Beach. Mm-mm. Some people say, it's a group out of Harbor City. Mm-mm. Okay. Now, you're telling me, this is the first time I ever heard Compton. Lonnie, uh, Lonnie. Uh, Lonnie Jordan, is Lonnie Jordan. I believe Lonnie Jordan still still alive. Yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay. interviewed um, Tim Howard. I interviewed Howard on my podcast. Lonnie Howard and Oscar. I went to uh, Captain High School. Okay, then the, the Dickerson guy. I believe he's from Harbor City. He might he? be from Harbor City. Okay, okay. okay. The core, the original, the, the original guys. The core came out of Compton High School. Wow. They used to be the house band for Jeffy's, which is the club under Eve After Dark. Wow. They left Jeff D's and, and got signed to UA. Okay. I'm glad you're sharing that, bro. Okay. Honestly. So, um, um, shit. Um, Bush, George Bush Jr., lived in Compton. Yes. Ellen Monroe lived in Compton. There yeah. been, there's, there's tons of um, Olympic gold medalists. There's tons of uh, NBA uh, championship holders. NFL championship holders came out of Compton, man. So one of the things I've been working on for the last past five years, and I'm just in a much better position to do it now, is to create the Compton Walk of Fame. Okay? That's beautiful, man. And I'm going to ask all your um, your subscribers if they would please download the app, the Compton Entertainment Chamber of Commerce. I need to get my numbers up. It don't cost anything to, to uh, anything to join. Just Compton, Compton Inter- Inter- Entertainment Chamber of Commerce. Okay. You'll see the big star. With the, I like stars. I, that's my shit. Um, with the logo on it. And uh, it's, it's on Android and uh, and and uh, iPhone. iPhone. Okay, just got all that hooked up, and you'll be able to get all my you'll be able to get all my uh, my podcasts will be on there. Plus the one I'm doing for Compton called the Compton Chronicles. So you have all my podcasts. You get okay. all my podcasts. You get all the uh, podcasts from Dr. Dre and myself, the uh, the uh, Legendary Connects, and you'll also get the uh, the uh, NWA Story with Alonzo. So that's my that's my new baby right now. Um, also, I'm doing a prostate cancer walk. I'm a prostate cancer survivor. Okay, awesome, man. any man out there over the age of forty with an asshole, go get yourself checked. Don't be, don't, don't play with it, dude. Don't, not, don't. Prostate cancer is is killing more black and brown men than anything else. Okay? okay, black and brown men die more from prostate cancer than anybody else, and black got you beat. Okay, it's not. Uh, it's not uh, something that you can stop because it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's the food we eat. Yes. Okay. And uh, I've been I've been a prostate cancer advocate for the last past twelve years. I had a pro- had prostate cancer about uh, in 2011, and the doctor told me the only thing that saved my ass was I caught it early. Okay. And I started talking about prostate cancer every time I got on the stage in my club. I told God because let me tell you another story before I get out of here. When I had prostate cancer, they tell you you're gonna go through all kinds of stages. They tell you you're gonna go through stages. You're gonna go through why me, why me, uh, denial, okay, mad, all kind of shit. And I did all that, okay. And I'm sitting at home one day, and I asked God. I said, man, why, why am I, why, why me? I'm Lonzo. I'm a good dude. I, I take care of people. Look out for folks. I'm passing by this street, passing by this street down the street by the club. It's a bus stop on San Pedro and El Segundo. Everybody hang out there smoking crack, drunk, whatever the case may be. Why one of them motherfuckers couldn't have prostate cancer? I'm, I'm less like that. I'm mad, okay? And God slapped me upside the head. He said, motherfucker, he said, fool, if they had it, would nobody listen? So I started talking about prostate cancer. Wow. And I realized how ignorant men are to prostate cancer. Because back then, the only way, the first way to check for it, you had to stick, your, you had to stick two fingers in your ass. Okay, he has to take two fingers, and they can see that your prostate is enlarged or not. If it's enlarged, they recommend you go to a, uh, a proctologist and possibly get a biopsy, like the same thing they did for me. But nowadays, 
that that um, that's that's they still use it, but it's not mandatory. You can do it through a blood test. You can get check your PSA and your Gleason score, all that shit through your blood test. I said that to say this because when I was going through prostate cancer, a black doctor, I'm at the Watts Healthcare Center feeling sorry for myself. My buddy called a black doctor into the room where I was sitting there talking, feeling sorry for myself. He said, my partner got prostate cancer. He says, man, anything you, anything you could tell him. He said, the doctor asked me a couple of questions. He said, um, what stage? I said, stage one. He said, how much, how much of your prostate has cancer? He said, I said, they found it in two, two areas. The black doctor told me this. Nigga, you ain't even sick. Uh-huh. He said, nigga, you ain't even sick. The shit you're dealing with, you got to deal with it. It's going to, you're, you're going to have some downtime, which means your shit going to be down for a minute, but you'll come back. Okay. But deal with it. They said a year from now, it'll be a bad dream. And I, and that's what, that's what scares most men. The fact that you look up one day and Mr. Johnson might not stand up like he's supposed to. Okay. And my doctor, after, after I had my prostate removed, okay, he gave me a prescription and told me you got to get therapy. I said, what kind of therapy, doc? He says, you got to get as much sex as you possibly can. Like that? Yeah. Here's some, here's some Cialis and get as much sex as you possibly can. Okay. For that, still, huh? You got to give me another beer. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. And, um, and I said, are you serious? He says, yes. Sex is your therapy. And I was 11 years ago and I'm still in therapy right now. I'm getting, I'm getting, That's a beautiful <laughs> therapy, man. Dude, I, I, and, and he said it's like any other muscle. If you hurt your leg or your finger and don't move it, you'll, it'll get stiff. Yeah, yeah, Okay? Yeah. And he says you got to use it as much as you can to get it back to where it is. So, like I said, folks, I'm, I'm still in recovery. I'm still in therapy 12 <laughs> years later. And... <laughs> All them sisters that talk that shit. About, Whatever you need, I wouldn't have you. Come on by the house, God damn it! I need some therapy. Nah, I mean. And that's my joke. So, yeah, man, that's real talk. But uh, yeah, I do a prostate cancer walk at Cal State Dominguez. Uh, this year it's going to be uh, October 17th. And, uh, you know, once you had prostate, once you had any kind of cancer, man, I it know. changed your attitude, man. It would, it would, it would. You learn to appreciate life, dude. Yes, sir. You learn to appreciate yes, life. Sir. Um, you got any? Okay, what? we got about six months till the year's over. Are you going to be doing any book signings or any special appearances or any meet and greets in LA anytime soon? We probably will, man. Uh, like I said, we just got through with San Diego, uh, uh, Sacramento. We did San Diego. Uh, we do better out of town because everybody sees us all the time. It's true. It's it, true. It, we do better out of town. Um, there's a there's an event called Black on the Block, sure and we like doing car. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. We like doing car shows, man, because. The, the 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 Brown brothers they love us yes. they love us man yes they love that shit so um we we uh, Yellow has a couple of car show connects I know um my man forgot his name he had us at the car show in East LA about two months ago he has another one coming up in October or September and we're doing that car show so yeah we'll we'll be in the, we'll be in the city you, you know what uh, I'm gonna speak for Rasa right here when I say this okay I'm gonna mention some groups you meant that you mentioned um, Isley Brothers the time, uh, Roger and Zap, Uncle Jam's Army, the World Class Wrecking Crew, um, Al Green. That's not oldies to us. It's not. It's like our music today. Right, right. And that's why we love supporting it. Oh, right on. I appreciate that. You know, we do. So sometimes when we see songs like, like Caramba with that fucking idiot doing shit like that, we like, yo, man, you know what? We would love to hear somebody else from us speak about it. Mm. And, and you did on your podcast. Okay. You know, you did. So thank you for that. No problem. You know, but but I had to address it because we do take that shit offensive, knowing that not only do we love black music, we love the black culture. Right. You know, and this is the one thing you probably didn't know, Lonzo, and, and all my fans know is that uh, I have our brother, four sisters, one of my brothers married a black woman. I have five black nephews and nieces, okay. you know, and I love mm. them. So when motherfucker tells me, hey, man, what do you, I had a caller the other day. He said, what are you doing talking to a black guy? That's what he said. Mm. I just hung up on his ass. And I said, you know what? If you hate black people, if you, hate, you know, and if you don't like, uh, uh, no, I said, if you hate black people, you don't like the color of them, don't follow me, don't subscribe, don't have nothing to do with this fucking show. Don't have nothing because I don't need that bullshit, okay? Because you're about fucking 50 years behind, bro. Right. Just saying, you know, you might as well just be from the fucking KKK, homeboy. Right. Right. You know, so anyways, other than that, uh, Lonzo, once again, 
I want to thank you for coming through. You know what? It's been a blessing. I love, always love talking to you. Like, bro, you just like got stories and stories and stories, <laughs> Dude, man. I've been doing this shit for sixty five fucking years. I know, man. I, and I love it. You know, and I love they it. tell they they tell me, well, you can you you gonna tell you gonna tell all your stories? Bullshit! You and Mark, they got, ain't got enough digital space to tell all my goddamn shit. Okay? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, anyways, other than that, uh, any shout outs? Oh man, shout out to the the Wrecking Crew, my uh, my my folks at the. Uh, Compton Entertainment Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, my partner, my partners. I got two female partners, uh, Nicole and Kimberly. They 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 the bomb. Um, I have another lyrical. I have another nonprofit, the Lyrical Revolution. Earl and Brent, Edwin, Vicky, all my folks, man. You know, right now, man, in this stage of my life, I'm not retired. I just do what the fuck I want to now. That's a beautiful thing, you know. I don't. I, I, I work for. I work for, on projects I like to do. I like signing books. I like meeting people. I like working with the community, and uh, I can go to bed at eleven o'clock like everybody else if I want to. That's a beautiful thing, and I'm going to say something that's going to piss a lot of people off. Oh yeah, my grandkids. I should have my grandkids. How they, many grandkids you got? I got five. Hold on. Five. I just had another one. I got five. Okay. Yeah. I got three. I'm about to have my fourth one. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to say something to piss a lot of people off, and I'm um, I'm glad I Oh, am. shit. Okay. Uh, I got seven. <laughs> <laughs> I got seven. It's all good. It's all good. You know what? I got a lot of Latino homies. And I was always, let me say, I got Chicano homies that love black girls. And I, I got a lot of black homies that love Chicanas. Bro, it's just the way it, it is. It is what it is, dog. It is what it is. It is what it is. See, back in the day, you know what we used to say? What? It's like that. Right. And, and that's, that's the, the way, way it is. is. So with that being said, once again, let me give a shout out to my boy, Alex Cervantes, Cervantes Enterprise. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my boy, Norbert, for uh, joining the Rodian Radio team. My son, Be Scandalous. It's not Be Nice. It's Be Scandalous. And the Hip Hop Jedi. And uh, I want to give a shout out to the Rolling Radio Warriors, everybody in the live chat, everybody who liked, subscribed, commented, shared, everybody who disliked. I don't care. You guys are still here. Much love, much respect. I'll see you guys here Wednesday. Have a blessed night. Once again, uh, uh, um, Lonzo, the Godfather of West Coast Hip Hop. Eventually, he'll be back again. Hopefully, it's not two years from now. <laughs> so we'll be back. Have a blessed night. We out of here. folks. We out.